uh, I think we have a different um, link here. Is it is it correct, John? Yeah, it looks like it's live now, according to John. Okay. So. I think we're ready to go now. Uh, so let's give. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we're live, so uh, let's get started. Okay. It sounds good. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess welcome everyone for our uh, last uh, Safari live seminar of 2021. Uh, we have Rahul Bera uh, today, who's a Safari member and a PhD student in Safari. And Rahul is going to present uh, the work that he has done on Pythia uh, at Micro 2021. Uh, this work introduces a new prefetching framework uh, that uses online reinforcement learning to make, to make decisions. And before joining Safari, Rahul was at Intel Processor Architecture Lab. And before that, he got his master's degree at IIT Kampur in India. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions. This is, I think, uh, quite interesting work uh, that pushes the boundaries of prefetching using uh, reinforcement learning uh, to make online decisions and enables the prefetcher to learn from its past actions and improve its ac accuracy and adaptation to workloads as well as system over time. And I think it's a nice direction uh, to pursue in the design of all types of controllers that we design. And prefetching is clearly an important controller that we design in computing systems. With that, I think I will let Rahul discuss uh, uh, Pythia and hopefully people will ask questions and make it interactive. Thanks, Thanks Anur. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Anur, for the introduction. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Rahul. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student working with Professor Namudlu in uh, ETH Zurich. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work uh, named Pythia, a customizable hardware prefetching framework using online reinforcement learning. So this work has been done by researchers at Safari Research Group in ETH Zurich in collaboration with Intel Labs and Dell. So let's first dive into the executive summary of the work. So, so as we know, prefetchers predict addresses of the future memory request by associating some memory access patterns with program context information, which we also call the program feature. So the, in this work, we identify three key shortcomings of prior prefetchers that significantly limit their performance improvement. So these three shortcomings are, first of all, they predict mainly using a single program feature. Second, they lack inherent system awareness like memory bandwidth utilization, and third, they lack in silicon customizability. To alleviate these three problems, uh, the goal of our work is to design a prefetching framework that can learn from multiple program features, as well as inherent system level feedback information. And it can be customized in silicon to use different program features or prefetching objectives on the fly. So towards this, we introduce Pythia that formulates prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, Pythia can take adaptive prefetch decisions using multiple program features and system level feedback information, as we will show later. Uh, it can also be customized in silicon for targeted workloads via simple configuration registers without requiring any changes to the underlying hardware structure itself. And at the same time, Pythia proposes a realistic and practical implementation of the RL algorithm in the hardware itself. So we extensively evaluate Pythia using a wide range of workloads ranging from spec CPU, Parsec, Lygra, Cloud Suit, and many more. And we show that Pythia outperforms prior best performing prefetchers by 3.4%, 7.7%, and 17% on average in single core, four core, and bandwidth constraint core configuration. We also show that Pythia can provide up to 7.8% more performance improvement on top of our basic Pythia configuration across Ligra graph processing workloads via simple online customizations. Pythia is completely open source and you can download the, the source code as well as all necessary uh, traces to evaluate from our GitHub repository. So this is going to be the brief uh, outline of today's talk. So I will start with the uh, basic uh, introduction to the prefetching and the key shortcomings of prior prefetches. So as I said, prefetching is uh, the speculative technique that predicts the address of long latency memory request and fetches the data before the program demands it. So pre for predicting the address of the long latency memory request, a prefetcher typically associates the program access pattern from past memory request with some program context information, which we also call a program feature. So some examples of program feature can be, you know, program counter value, or let's say page number, page offset, cache line delta, or it can be actually a combination of any of these attributes also. 
So in this work, we identify three key shortcomings that significantly limit prior prefetches performance improvement. So the, 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 these, these three problems are first, they predict mainly using a single program feature. Second, they lack inherentization awareness. And third, they lack in silicon customizability. Now let's take a closer look at each of these three uh, key shortcomings. So the first key shortcoming is that almost all prior prefetches provide good only use single program feature for prefetch prediction. And as a result, they provide good performance gain mainly on those workloads where this, where this feature to pattern correlation dominantly exists. So to illustrate this, I will show you three, uh, two prior prefetches, SPP and Bingo, which is uh, state of the art in the recent times, uh, in, uh, the performance improvement of SPP and Bingo for four workloads here. And as you can see, uh, for the three workloads we mentioned uh, on the green side of the box, the Spins, Parsec, Canil, and the Parsec Face Sim, Bingo significantly outperforms SPP. Uh, while in the other workloads, like uh, James FTTD, SPP again uh, outperforms Bingo uh, by uh, almost a 5%. So now the key reason behind this dichotomy is that SPP and Bingo, each of them uses different sort of program feature for uh, pro program pattern correlation learning. And as a result, Bingo and SPP performs better than the other in those type of workloads where these pattern to sorry the feature to pattern correlation dominantly exists. So the key takeaway from this figure is that essentially relying on a single program feature for prediction leaves a significant performance improvement on table. Instead of prefetches should try to learn from multiple of such program feature in order to have uh, in order to have a better performance improvement across a wide range of workload configurations okay so that's the first uh, the key shortcoming the second key shortcoming that we uh, identify is that almost every prior prefetches they have very little understanding of their undesirable effects like memory bandwidth usage cash pollution energy uh, energy consumption into consideration while making a prefetch decision and as a result, what happens is that these prefetches often uh, uh, often face performance loss in resource constraint configurations. To illustrate this, let's let's go back to performance analysis in two workloads: the Ligra CC, the connected component, and the Parsec Canil workloads for three prefetches: SPP, Bingo, and Pythia. On the left hand side, we are showing the coverage, uncover uh, the uncovered portion of the demand accesses, and the over prediction of each of these uh, prefetches in two workloads. And on the right hand side, we are showing the performance benefit uh, on top of a no prefetching baseline for each of these workloads for three prefetches. Okay, so as we can see here, that if we fo closely focus Bingo's performance in these two workloads, like the CC and Parsec Canyon, what we are seeing here is that Bingo has almost similar coverage in like the CC as, as compared to the Parsec Canyon while having a significantly lower uh, over prediction for uh, Ligra CC as compared to Parsec right? But if we see the performance side of the story, what it shows that Bingo in Ligra CC actually underperforms even the no prefetching baseline, whereas in, in uh, Parsec Canil, it out significantly outperforms the no prefetching baseline. So now why is this uh, contrasting behavior that bingo even uh, it has similar coverage with significantly lower over prediction still uh, reduces the performance than the no fetching baseline the reason is that the ligra cc as a workload it itself has a high memory bandwidth usage even without prefetching so what happens if you turn on bingo for ligra cc even a smaller amount of over prediction has a more detrimental impact to its performance improvement as compared to the condition in the past second. So what happened then what happens is that even a small amount of over prediction significantly loses the performance improvement, while uh, even a bigger amount of over prediction, you, you end up the being end up winning uh, the performance benefits. So the key takeaway from this figure is that a prefecture might often lose performance benefit due to their lack of inherent system awareness. Instead, a prefecture should take, uh, take the uh, system level feedback into consideration while making a prefetch decision to provide a, a consistent and robust performance improvement across a wide range of system configuration. The third uh, key shortcoming is that every prior prefecture they select the program feature that they want to exploit statically at the design time and then they create a rigid hardware beside this uh, statically selected feature that is explicitly designed to exploit that program feature as a result there is no way to change this program feature or to change the prefetch's objective in silicon on the fly 
And as a result, what happens is that these privileges can more often than not, they cannot uh, adopt to a wide range of workload demands. And if we want to design uh, a new prefecture that exploits a new program feature, we need to essentially design a new prefecture from scratch, then extensively verify that design, and then finally fabricate to the processor. And this cycle simply repeats for every new prefecture design that happens in the wild. So this not only signif significantly uh, lengthens the design time, but also it lengthens the human effort to design these prefetches. Right? So to elevate these three challenges that I discussed just now, our goal of this work is to, uh, to have the twofold benefits. The first, uh, that we are trying to introduce a prefetching framework that learns to prefetch using multiple program features, as well as inherent system level feedback information. And the second benefit is that it can be easily customized in silicon to use different program features or to change the prefetches objective on the fly. So towards this, we introduce Pythia, which formulates a prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. So now I'll... I'll uh, Rahul, yeah. maybe I, I will stop you here. This may be a good point. Uh, sure. So I have one question on these three uh, shortcomings. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you said uh, prior prefetchers use one feature. Aren't there any prefetchers that use more than one feature? Uh, that, that, yes, that's a good question. So Bingo, uh, which was presented in uh, HPCA 2019, if I'm not wrong. So Bingo uh, is the first prefetcher that introduced the concept of using multiple program features. But then there are... Uh, uh, like the they have some uh, uh, inherent uh, requirements which type of program features they can in, incorporate into uh, the requirement is that one program feature should be der derivable from the other program features for example let's say pc plus address and pc plus uh, offset can be two program features that can be incorporated in bingo's framework because if you know the actual cache line address that you are trying to access, you essentially know the cache line offset in the page that you're accessing. So in, in a sense, you can derive the PC plus offset feature from the PC plus address as a feature. And that's why you can only use these two pair. So th this pair as a combination. But in, in our case, what we are trying to aim is that we can literally incorporate any sorts of program feature. It's then they cannot, like there is no requirement of being derivable or no conditions whatsoever. You can literally throw at any program feature that you can think of and it it would uh, eventually learn from those features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense, I think. Uh, so uh, that uh, maybe I'll ask you this question later on, but it's probably because of the design of the framework that you were described, right? Because technically, <laughs> Uh, technically, you can imagine many features, right? As a prefetcher designer, and you can hash them into some <laughs> into some value. But of course, uh, how to use the features is a difficult problem as a exactly. designer, right? So, in in the end, what we or or let's say in the end, what what Bingo is also doing, we we are some sort of like doing the hashing. And uh, let's say the hashing gives you the, the location that you, you want to store the knowledge into, right? And then you would distill the knowledge in some way so that you can make use of that knowledge to make, make accurate predictions in the future, right? And that's what we are also trying to do here, that you, 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 you would represent the knowledge and for the representing this knowledge, we are taking cues from the reinforcement learning side, right? That oh, you, you have features in one side and as well as you have the, let's say, system level feedback in the other side to represent this knowledge in such a way that you, in, you can incorporate not only the features, but also the feedback and everything fits into a holistic framework that eventually gives you a, a you know, system aware multi-feature predictions. Yeah, I think we'll get back to this later. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I think. I think the uh, the the benefit of the framework is the fact that it can enable automatic use of the features. Yes. Yes. Whereas if a human is designing uh, with multiple features, they have to somehow figure out how to make how to make sense of the features, right? So th that's what I'm I'm trying to say here, right? That if you if you are trying to design a new uh, feature to exploit a new pre feature. What normally we do is we, we have to design a new prefecture from the scratch. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's a way to go forward, right? But at least uh, after Pythia, what we are envisioning that you have a common framework, you just need to design a new feature that you are thinking of and you just supply that uh, feature. I, I'll come back to this later also, how to uh, you know uh, 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 configure this on the fly so that you can just simply exploit it uh, the way you like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. If you go back to the second issue, which is yeah, yeah. inherent system awareness. 
maybe it's good to distinguish uh, what it means to be inherent because clearly there have been proposals to oh, make, okay, make yeah. any, let's say any prefetcher system aware, uh, yeah. like a feedback directed prefetching proposal or coordinated control of multiple prefetchers by That's Iman Ibrahimi. These are techniques that uh, try to make any prefetcher, they're, they're really prefetching algorithm independent. Mm -hmm. And they try to make uh, prefetchers aware of their decisions, their accuracy, coverage, timeliness, pollution, etc., and throttle the prefetchers up and down based on that information, as well as information about how much interference they're causing in the system, how much bandwidth they're using, etc. So exactly. uh, I think you mean something else over here, and you're not referring to those techniques, but maybe okay, you could okay, clarify yeah, what so you mean. Yeah, so the, this is a good point, actually. So, so what, what do I mean here uh, by the word inherent is that, uh, as uh, you, you suggested, right, that there are multiple walks in, in, in the prior uh, literature that, that incorporates this system awareness as an add-on on top of the underlying prefetching framework, right? Uh, so, so the prefetch algorithm by itself is not changing, right? What you're changing is the aggress aggressiveness of the prefetching algorithm. Oh, uh, should, should, should we increase the, let's say, the prefetcher look ahead? Should we increase the prefetcher degree based on the feedback that we are receiving from the system? So what we found out in our uh, like exploration is that if you also incorporate this, this uh, system level feedback, not as a second, uh, second class citizen of this design choice, but as a first class citizen of the design choice, and you essentially design your prefetch algorithm from the grounds up that inherently takes this uh, feedbacks into account to even generate the prefetch request, not curating the prefetch request on top of what you have generated. But even generating the prefetch request, you are taking this into consideration. Then you uh, finally provide much more uh, system aware, much more, uh, let's say, dynamic uh, prefetch algorithm that can adapt to multiple, uh, let's say, wide range of system configuration than, than what we have seen before. So I'll, I'll also, uh, let's say, briefly introduce uh, some uh, commercial uh, system level feedback aware prefetches like what we have seen in Power 7, prefetch, uh, Power 7 PC from IBM. And we have also uh, done some uh, analysis against the, that prefetching framework. Uh, and we show that uh, Pythia indeed uh, you know, provide better uh, system awareness than uh, that framework itself. OK, that, that sounds good. OK, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, feel free to stop me uh, if you have any questions in the audience. And then I'll, I'll just uh, you know, go ahead and, and move forward. OK, so, so, so yeah. So, so yeah, so, so the second stage uh, is uh, of the talk is that uh, I'll, I'll briefly introduce what we, we mean by reinforcement learning and then how we are modeling the problem of prefetching in the reinforcement learning framework. So reinforcement learning in the simplest form is the algorithmic approach to learn to take an action in a given situation to maximize a numerical reward. So every RL framework has two key components, the agent and the environment. The agent senses the state of the environment at every time step and taking this state into account, the agent takes an action. And for every action, the agent also receives a reward from the environment that it uses to reinforce the correlation between the state and the action. So for, for every state action pair, the agent uh, stores something we call Q value, which essentially uh, represents the expected return for taking that action in the given state. So you can think of it as a, a matrix of uh, that that tells you how good it is to take that action in the given state. Okay, uh, so any given state uh, 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 st at, at, at in any point of time, the agent simply selects the action that provides the highest q value, and that's how the RL agent uh, essentially moves forward and then uh, passes the state action space. So in this work, we formulate the hardware prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem where the prefetcher itself acts as the RL agent and the processor and memory subsystem acts as the agent's environment. So for every demand request, the prefetcher or Pythia uh, it extracts a state of program feature from the memory request to the address A and uses this state of program features as a state information to take a prefetch action. For every prefetch action, the Pythia also receives a reward from the environment, uh, which evaluates the usefulness of the prefetch request be, uh, under the given um, system level feedback information. Uh, Pythia uses this reward to reinforce the correlation and to learn what to prefetch in the given uh, state information. 
Okay, so this is the very uh, brief uh, high-level view of uh, Pythia. Now let's let's go back and analyze each of these components of the RLH in the state action and reward in our context. How we are defining it. So we define the state as a k-dimensional vector of program features, where each feature is composed of at most two key components: the program control flow component and the program data flow component. So what do I mean by program control flow component? It can be uh, anything, uh, uh, for example, a program counter value, or let's say the branch counter, uh, uh, branch program counter value, or let's say a sequence of last three load program counter values, and so on and so forth. And some examples of the data flow uh, component can be, let's say, the cache line address value, or let's say the physical page number, the delta between two consecutive cache line addresses, the last four deltas, and so on and so forth. So you can literally think of any uh, data flow uh, component and any control flow component and create your own uh, feature information by concatenating or, or, or by uh, using these two components together. So for one, so um, let me give you one example of a state information here. So in this case, the state information is composed of two uh, features. So one is the PC plus delta feature and another one is the sequence of last four delta feature. The feature one is for the composed of the control flow information like PC and the data flow information cache line delta, whereas the feature two is entirely composed of data flow information of sequence of last four cache line data. Okay, so so now let's let's go to the definition of action. So we define the action of Pythia as the uh, selection of a prefetch offset O. So given a demand access to an address A. Pythia selects the prefetch offset O and then adds this prefetch offset value to the demanded cache line address to generate the prefetch cache line address. So the action space, as we can uh, imagine, the action space contains 127 actions in the range of minus 63 to plus 63. Why is, there, why is this range? Uh, because uh, if a machine has a traditionally sized 4KB page and 64 byte cache line, so that means essentially you can have, let's say, uh, uh, the, the options that 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 are in front of you uh, can range from uh, either from 0 to 63 or let's say 0 to minus 63. So that's the action space, the size of the action space, which is 127 actions in total. So this upper limit and the lower limits are actually ensuring that the prefetches do not cross the physical page boundary. And also note this, that the zero offset is also a valid uh, uh, prefetch action for Pythia, which essentially means that Pythia decides not to prefetch anything. Okay, so uh, as we'll show in the paper that uh, the, we can significantly prune down this 127 action space uh, by automatic design space exploration uh, without uh, having uh, much impact on the performance benefit of Pythia. Okay, so now let's let's go to the reward definition of Pythia. So the de reward defines the objective for Pythia, which encapsulates two key metrics. One, prefetch usefulness, like whether the prefetch was accurate, whether it was late, or whether it was going out of the physical page limit, and so on and so forth. And the second metric is the system level feedback information, for example, memory bandwidth usage, cash pollution, the energy consumption, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, Though the, the framework that we designed for Pythia is uh, capable enough to incorporate any type of system level feedback into account, in this paper, we will demonstrate with using a major system level feedback of a prefecture, which is memory bandwidth usage as an example of system level feedback information. Okay. So uh, having this said, we define the uh, reward values into seven distinct reward levels mentioned as follows, the accurate and timely, accurate but late, loss of coverage, inaccurate and no prefetch. So each of these reward level values roughly corresponds to various uh, usefulness of prefetch request. And note that the inaccurate and the no prefetch reward level values are further categorized based on the uh, memory bandwidth usage. So the value of each of these reward levels as are fixed at a design time via automatic design space exploration, but one can change these values runtime on the on the fly in silicon using simple configuration registers to provide a different prefetching objective to Pythia. Okay, so now let me let me give you a brief example of what do I mean by let's say uh, prefetching objective to uh, to a Pythia and how the changing the reward level values can actually. Uh, uh, can actually give Pythia our intention of how we want the prefecture to work. Okay. Hey, Rahul, before you proceed, can I ask a question? So yes. Is, yes. Yeah. 
it's about the, the the parameters you choose, right? How, for example, how do you choose? So you choose, you say that you use memory bandwidth as a metric to, mm -hmm. to use as a system level feedback. Why do you choose that feedback and what other um, metric could you use and why did you choose that one uh, exactly? Because you just observe that you get better results with that or what is the okay. reason yeah. for choosing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so one reason why we uh, focused on uh, memory level, uh, uh, sorry, memory bandwidth usage as the uh, first and foremost example of the system level feedback in in our uh, demonstration is that the memory level, you uh, memory bandwidth usage is uh, probably the most uh, let's say dominating uh, side effects that that a prefetcher has on the overall system. Okay, so uh, if, if we go back to the, uh, I would like to cite our previous work, uh, which is called Dispatch, uh, which was presented in Micro 2019. Uh, uh, so in that work, what we have found is that uh, cache pollution, though, is the second, like another uh, dominant side effect of a prefetching uh, algorithm, right? The the cache pollution often do not in uh, impact the overall performance improvement as much if you have a good uh, cache replacement policy in, in force. So let's say if you have a good uh, date block prediction mechanism going on, or let's say if you have an intelligent uh, cache replacement uh, policy that incorporates the prefetch usefulness also into account, then the impact, the system level impact of, uh, let's say the system's performance impact of cache pollution is actually minimal. So we have also like, like we have added um, so in, in the appendix section of that paper we have shown that that this is indeed the case that uh, cash pollution might not be uh, uh, any more severe if you have an aggressive prefetcher turned on but that's actually not the case for the memory bandwidth usage because uh, in, in today's uh, like commercial processes they are actually getting designed for various uh, levels of systems right so let's say for the consumer level system or let's say the server level system which has different uh, let's say bandwidth uh, per core bandwidth uh, availability uh, in, in the design uh, space so what we have seen there is that if you significantly limit let's say the perform uh, the memory bandwidth uh, availability for for each core your prefetch's performance benefit significantly drops and i'll i'll come back to the, the this uh, uh, results also that all, many prior prefetches are actually started even performing poorer than a no prefetching baseline, which essentially says that if, if you just simply turn off the prefetcher, the system provides a better performance than having the prefetchers on. So in our, like to, to summarize what I'm just saying, uh, memory bandwidth usage in our experience became the first and the most dominant side effects that we have seen uh, uh, to have a prefetchers enabled on the uh, system. So that's why we uh, demonstrate using the memory level uh, use uh, like so bandwidth usage. But as I said, like we can also incorporate other uh, feedback information like cache pollution or let's say even energy efficiency into the game. And 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 PTS framework would actually learn from uh, those feedbacks eventually. Uh, does it answer your question, please? Yes, it answers my questions. Thank, thanks, Rahul. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have another question from YouTube. Uh, sure, sure. It now. So I, I will just read it. So um, it says, question about modeling the prefetching problem as MDP. How the prefetch action determines the next state here? For example, if PC is state, how next PC if, is determined by, by action? As far as I understood, the next state depends on the program behavior, but not based on the action taken. It is not clear to me. Can you please explain how prefetching is modeled as MVP? Uh, okay. Um, so in this case, what we what we design envision the MDP as uh, let's say the each of the nodes, as as the question suggests, right? The, uh, each of the node in this the each of the state in this MDP uh, uh, diagram is just the program uh, state, right? That, oh, let's say I'm executing this load instruction. Uh, the, the last few uh, sequences of load instructions are like this. Uh, let's say that that's a sequence of instruction. The last few, uh, let's say the cache line addresses that you have touched are this, this, this. Last few previous requests that you have generated are this, this, this. So that's the entire thing. You can think of it as a state information, right? And then the program is simply jumping from state to state. 
correct so that's the that's the uh, the, the the state information in the mdp and then the edge from one state to the other state is when you are transitioning from that program state to the other program state and at the same time you are also generating an action which is the prefetch request right so then this prefetch request eventually uh, like sorry the prefetch request in turn is interacting with the system and giving you a feedback like okay what is the memory level usage right or, or sorry memory bandwidth usage or let's say uh, uh, like like what would be the cache pollution uh, if you if you incorporate this prefetch into account so then if you also consider those information as a state information in the mdp then you are essentially transitioning from one state to the other state and you are generating one action in the middle right and what we are trying to chase here is that how we should generate the action so that uh, the 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 overall uh, let's say the performance of the mdp or, i mean the performance of the system uh, improves essentially so um, is it like answering the question if it is not clear then i can again come back later uh, i think it's clear but if the the author of the questions has any doubts he can write again well, 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 feel free to, yeah, feel free to uh, like question or or if you have more, more doubts feel free to uh, write it there and I'll, i'll come back to this question again do we have any more questions guys no more questions for now okay okay thanks guys okay so 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 yeah so we started from here that um, so this is a reward level values that that, that that we are envisioning here right and then uh, so now now let let's take a concrete example of what exactly these reward level values mean right or or, or let's say how this reward uh, like uh, configuring this reward level values is uh, changing the reward uh, sorry so changing the prefetching objective for prithi okay so let me give you an example of uh, a reward configuration that 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 uh, encourages prithi to generate accurate prefetches whenever possible but at the same time uh, also encourages prithi for making the bandwidth aware prefetch decisions so this is this is how the uh, con uh, the, the reward level values are laid out right so as you can see that uh, the the accurate late and accurate timely has a high, high reward whereas the other uh, let's say no no prefetching or the inaccurate prefetching reward is is very less so if we set the reward level values like this we are essentially providing three key prefetching objectives to pithia what so so the first prefetching objective is that we are giving pithia much higher perk to generate uh, accurate prefetch request whether it's timely or untimely right or whether it's timely or late right so what what pithia would do is that it would uh, high like it would prefer highly prefer generating accurate prefetches whenever possible because we are providing much more higher box to uh, pithia for generating accurate prefetches correct now uh, if we if you if it can uh, if it can't generate any accurate prefetch then what would happen is that if if your bandwidth usage if the memory bandwidth usage is low then we are providing a slightly higher uh, uh, reward for generating no prefetch request rather than inaccurate prefetch request right so as a result what pithia would do it, it would slightly prefer not to gen generate any prefetch request rather than generating something inaccurate prefetches if the memory bandwidth usage is low okay but then if the memory bandwidth usage is high then we are favoring the no prefetching decisions and we are giving more perks to pithia for generating no prefetch request rather than inaccurate prefetch request because it's minus 2 and minus 14 right as a result what pithia would do is pithia would strongly prefer not to generate uh, any inaccurate prefetch request rather to simply stay quiet and generate no prefetch request uh, if the memory bandwidth usage is extremely high okay so now if we if we if we change this reward level uh, configuration if we if we change this reward configuration by slightly and if we like by increasing the uh, no pre reward for no prefetching uh, no prefetching rewards by plus 1 and plus 2 while significantly reducing the rewards for the inaccurate prefetching we are uh, making pithia conservative towards prefetching how is that in this case we are still providing much more higher perks to pithia for generating accurate so pithia will continue to generate prefetch request for whenever uh, it's possible right but then if pithia cannot generate a 
uh, accurate refresh rate or let's say if it has a some sort uh, let's say if it if it has a prediction that this refresh request might be inaccurate right or might not be uh, yeah might not be even required from the code then we are providing much higher perk to pithia for just simply staying uh, quiet no prefetch right irrespective of the memory bandwidth usage here that the high and the low both for both the cases your no prefetching has much more higher value than the inaccurate prefetching so as a result what would happen is that if the if pithia cannot generate an accurate prefetch request it would just simply prefers not to prefetch so this is just making the pithia conservative towards generating prefetch request so this configuration we are calling it as a strict pithia configuration we'll come back to this configuration and what are the performance implication of such configurations later on the talk but uh, keep this in mind that these type of uh, let's say on the fly configurations are actually important for uh, uh, designing a server class processes where uh, each core has a very modest per core main memory bandwidth as compared to uh, uh, let's say a, a client uh, oriented uh, processor designs right or let's say if you're designing a processor for uh, let's say bandwidth sensitive workloads for example large scale uh, graph analytics uh, workloads then also this type of uh, strict Pythia configuration might come into hand. So the performance implication of this uh, configuration, I'll come back to uh, this later in the evaluation section. And hopefully that would be clear by that time that why do we need this uh, sort of, let's say, on-fly configuration. So do we have any question till now, uh, till this reward level configurations or? Well, I have, I have one question, maybe others have questions also, but uh, let yeah. me ask since it's on this topic. So you show two ways of setting the rewards. One is mm -hmm. less strict and the other is strict. Yes. And certainly, uh, yeah, I, I can see that uh, these different ways have different benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, but can this be all done uh, while running a single workload? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the way that we are providing these rewards to uh, the framework is via, uh, via simple, let's say, registers, right? So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mapped registers. You can just simply configure these registers on the fly, right? Mm -hmm. Even while the workload is running. So what would happen, the expectation is what would happen in this case that uh, the moment you have changed the intention or, or let's say the, the objective of uh, the prefetching, it would take some time to learn. And then after that time, you would see that the drastic drop in the number of prefetch requests generated, right? And then it would just simply become more conservative towards. Yeah, yeah I think I, I agree. And that makes sense. That's actually a nice capability, right? Uh, to customize yeah. uh, the prefetcher on the fly. Uh, yes. And you can, you can do it on a per application basis as well. If you have these registers That's true. That's uh, true. On, a, on a per application, or if you have the Pythia configuration customizable on a per application basis, right? So and I think so that could be quite powerful. <laughs> Yeah, so so the, this actually brings a very a very good point that all the performance uh, benefits that we ha we have reported in the paper, they are actually coming from a, a let's say unless it's uh, unless it's stated, so they are coming from a out of the box configuration which we have uh, like fig uh, configured based on the automatic design space exploration for all the workloads that we have designed, right? Mm -hmm. But then you can uh, easily uh, fine tune the framework for each individual application. And then the overall benefit of Pythia as compared to the prior base performing features would be even higher than that, right? So, so, so yeah, so we, we, we can definitely do that and, and, yeah. and extract more performance benefit out of the same framework. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the potential of the idea is higher than what's demonstrated in the paper. Uh, but, but then there's one question I think that's also important. Uh, if you can do this, Mm -hmm. dynamically or uh, on a per application basis, who does it, right? Who, who sets uh, these reward values uh, ah. and the registers uh, mm -hmm. dynamically or, or even statically, right? Right now you have different configurations and presumably the system designer says, oh, I want to use this configuration and it's set. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I, I would probably say that this is one of the uh, next, uh, let's say, stages for developing Pythia would be that to have this capability also on the fly to understand which configuration might be better for the uh, the workload that is exactly running on right now. Mm -hmm. But but in the current, uh, let's say, implementation or in the current version of Pythia, what, what we are envisioning here is that if you know how, how your, uh, let's say, uh, 
customizing your processes for let's say if you are customizing your processor for uh, just running massive uh, large scale graph analytics then you know what type of uh, let's say uh, behavior you should expect from those kernels that you are run, ever, like running again and again right then you know how to uh, change the, uh, the the prefecture configuration that is already there right and and the system designer it would be system designer's responsibility to you know configure it beforehand and then just make it uh, like a special purpose let's say but but yeah i mean i i would totally agree with you on this front that uh, having this also uh changing on the fly without any human intervention must be uh, yeah I mean, it, sh it it should be in the, in the next uh, let's say target for for the developing this framework yeah. yeah i mean maybe without any human intervention is uh like uh, too big of a next step uh, it could be but maybe you have a uh, classes uh of let's say configurations and yeah, you switch yeah. between them right dynamically yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, all... uh, k-means <laughs> clustering uh, let's say like, and you have some sort of predefined knowledge that okay if it is probably going into this class then yeah just just switch to that uh, exactly that. yeah whereas uh, i think complete uh, maybe you have some ideas uh we can discuss later but automatically determining the reward values completely uh, it's, it's... Requ it requires a design space exploration on itself right or potentially <laughs> A learning algorithm by itself. I don't know what. What are yeah. your thoughts? So, so the, my thoughts on this direction. Actually, I have tried on. Uh, let's say not only just the reward level configuration, but also the feature level configuration. That the, the feature config, uh, like reconfigurability that we are envisioning. That's also that also has same type of uh, let's say uh, drawbacks, right? That if if the designer knows what feature would would be better, then they can for sure ex exploit that benefit of that feature. But then can we can we deduce these features automatically so my my thoughts on this direction or at least uh, i i uh, i am thinking on that direction is that uh, so we can do this but the cost of uh, let's say uh, deriving the features that are best automatically without human intervention might require much more complex uh, let's say circuit logic for for example if i give you uh, the analogous per counterpart for, on the uh, uh, neural network design right that we have the uh, sim simple uh, single layer perceptron design and then we have the convolution networks right the convolution layer itself is de deriving these features for us but then the convolution itself is a very compute intensive task so then there comes the trade off probably that how much is too much for the system level uh, adoption of uh, let's say uh, learned algorithm right and then we we might uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would be definitely it would be good to see what is the extent of this idea and also what, what would be the extent in terms of the practicality that we can achieve uh, while staying in the realm of uh, implementation. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. So do we have any more questions uh, from the audience? Hi, Rahul. Uh, Constantino. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you something? It's about the same spirit of customizability as Honor asked. Mm -hmm. So the question is, like, what are the limits of Pythia towards uh, customization? And what do I mean by that? For example, you said that we can reconfigure the, um, uh, the features that we use in, uh, that we can take into account in our learning, learning algorithm, or we can, for example, tune the rewards accordingly, or mm -hmm. some type of profiling. The question is, let's say that the, um, System maintainer wants to add, finds out in his application that he and he wants to add a, a new feature into Pythia, or he mm -hmm. wants to add another type of reward. So, what is the limit of Pythia? Can we add everything inside the, the chip, the same chip, um, and then let the system maintainer uh, do his job and uh, choose the ones that he wants, or we are constrained in some way, but by the maybe the fabrication or the okay providing all the possible features and uh, all the possible rewards i see i see okay like, so how can we extend is it possible to extend pythia with new features or new reward okay so then that's a good question actually so so um, so to answer this question uh, i would say um, so in the current uh, implementation what we are uh, the, uh, the the goal here or, or let's say the vision here is that you have a list of features that you have implemented, right? While you are designing this process, uh, the, the, this uh, prefecture, right? So let's say in, for our case, we have designed 32 uh, individual features, correct? Now, 
what we are limited with uh, what we are limited by is the uh, how many features you can learn simultaneously from because that number directly impacts how much uh, let's say on chip space that you would need to devote for pithia so what do i mean by this so let's say you have 32 possible feature definitions that you have designed right but then you want uh, let's say oh i want any three combination of uh, of a feature right or let's say i want any four combination of a feature so you have to define that in the design time saying that okay my prefetched design is going to support up to four combinations or let's say up to five combination and that defines how much of area that you would want from this prefetched design but if you're saying let's say my uh, i i would support or let's say the prefetched would support uh, any four feature but which of this four feature would be out of that 32 feature that you can always change on the fly uh, does it uh, Did, did you get what I'm saying? So oh, I understand. Yes, you me. have a set of supported features, right? And then you have a limitation of how many features you can learn at once. But then, which features combinations that you want to learn from? That's up completely up to you. Yeah. So if you the, to, yeah. yeah. So I assume the number of uh, uh, on the uh, of supporting on the fly and like four or five. features depends also on your area then right yes, so exactly how much storage uh, like the metadata storage space that you have want that would also you know uh, like increase the amount of uh, core area that, that that you are also consuming yes yeah and about the reward like you could implement oh. the three main types for example the cache pollution or the bandwidth and then uh, let the Like, how does Pythia, for example, work if you have two types of feedback in, instead of one? Okay, okay. So, so if you, if you have two types of feedback, so what we what how we design is uh, design these different features are the uh, sorry the rewards are the following. So, we know that okay, if if your bandwidth is a uh, problem, then which between which two uh, let's say mode we want to toggle. If the bandwidth is problem, uh, or let's say if if the bandwidth utilization is high, then uh, Let's say, think of it as a as a human designer, right? What do we want if the bandwidth is high? We want the prefetcher to turn down the aggression, right? Or, or, to be less aggressive. So that means we we want to play with the no prefetching. Uh, uh, let's say when you want to take this action of no prefetching, right? Uh, on the on the other hand, if the bandwidth usage is re really low, then I mean inaccurate is still fine, right? I mean uh, if, unless it, the cache pollution is really bad. So. If you want to incorporate a new reward in this framework, right? The first thing that we have to de define is as a human, uh, let's say, designer, right? As a human uh, uh, thing, uh, thought process. What do we want from this framework, right? For for, for example, let's say, in if the accurate, uh, if we want to incorporate the uh, bandwidth, sorry, the cache pollution into the game. Then what we say that okay, if the memory bandwidth usage is uh, low, right? If the memory bandwidth uh, usage is low, we decided to go for inaccurate prefetching. But is inaccurate prefetching really not hurting the performance of the system? If the answer is yes, then we need a further uh, says uh, like uh, further the fine grain categorization there. That okay, I will say if the bandwidth usage is low and the cache pollution is also low, then probably inaccurate is fine again. Otherwise, you again go back to the no prefetching mode. You get what I'm saying. So, what we have to do is, as a human designer, we just need to think how we want the prefetcher to react into various level of uh, feedback, and then we would just simply design the reward levels based on that, and provide the appropriate values of those reward levels. And you would just simply uh, see the uh, the framework is of like auto tuning towards that 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 behavior that you wanted. Does it uh, answer yeah. your question? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Constantinos. Yeah, maybe maybe I will I will build on what uh, you stopped at based on Constantinos's question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what you said uh, now makes uh, like now pushes the complexity into mm -hmm. the reward function, right? So that now the human designer needs to deal a lot with the reward function to get it right. uh okay so so no so so the idea is that uh, 
not to get it right means uh, we are just defining the reward level uh, reward levels right not the exact value of these levels so what we want is to design the reward structure like this right what would be the value of this reward level that you can always do for the automatic design space exploration right that that, that we have done in this work also so we have a framework to you know fine tune these values of, of the reward level given a say, trace list right it would just simply c- come up with the reward level values that works best for you yeah, so, I, I, yeah, I understand. Basically, there's some exact values human designer doesn't need to exactly. determine, but they need to still determine uh, the categories of reward, what yeah. you call reward levels, basically. Yeah, if yeah. They, if, also- if they if they if they make a mistake in those categories, what will happen? Yeah, then 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 the the system would train in a different way that that that, that it is de- defined, right? No, I mean, yeah. So if if we are giving different, uh, let's say, false reward. There is no way that we can correct, or let's say the intelligence can correct the false reward, right? Because reward is in the end what the agent receives as the intention of uh, how it should react to, right? If you are uh, if you are providing, let's say, a false reward, uh, I mean, false reward. Let's say for for a, for example, if I just provide uh, in this case, if I, if I provide a reward for let's say no prefetching to be extremely high, let's say thousand, ten thousand. There is no way that the agent can learn that this is not what we wanted to do, because a, a agent is completely, uh, how should I say, like, trusting this reward level values and optimizing its policy to match this expectation. But if your expectation is wrong by itself, then the agent would simply converge to that wrong expectation itself. Yeah, yeah, and that's I think uh, that's that was my point basically. Reward function becomes very important. Uh, maybe uh, maybe it's not. Uh, it's so not the as, as difficult. Is... Yeah, as yeah. difficult as uh, like guessing the values, of course. No, so, or, so, or heuristic no. based mechanisms that tried to do this in the past. Exactly. So you don't have to set the values. Mm-hmm. You just need to frame it in a way that we, as a designer, would want the prefecture to react. To. So are yes. you going? To, uh, yeah, are you going to talk about how to how you do that at design space exploration for setting the reward function values? Uh, in this case, uh, I can I can uh, go through. So I have some uh, slides also in the in the backup. I can I, I can go through uh, how, how we have uh, set or let's say what is the design space that we have looked into and, and how. I think yeah, I think that'll be useful actually. Maybe not right now, but when when you talk about the results, I think it'd be useful sure. to talk about that design space. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. We, we we can go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Okay. If not, then uh, let me go through the design overview section. So, okay. So this is a high level uh, overview of Pithya's design. So Pithya is composed of two key components, the Q value store, which is responsible for recording the Q values of all state action pairs. And the other component is the evaluation queue, a FIFO queue of the recently taken actions. So for every demand request that Pithya sees, uh, the first thing that it does is to use the demanded memory address to look up into the evaluation queue. If it finds a corresponding entry in the evaluation queue, then it just simply assigns a, a reward to this evaluation queue entry. Uh, the second step is that Pithya extracts a state vector from the demand request and use it to look up the queue restore uh, to find the action that has the maximum queue value, uh, the maximum queue value essentially. Pithya uses this action to generate the prefetch request and, and injects the prefetch request into the memory hierarchy. At the same time, Pithya uh, inserts the prefetch action as well as the state action pair in the evaluation queue entry. So for every insertion in the evaluation queue, you are also evicting some evaluation queue entry from the head of this uh, EQ evaluation queue. Pithya uses the ev- evicted evaluation queue entry to uh, and the reward stored in, in inside the evicted evaluation queue entry to update the queue restore. And the last piece of the puzzle is that for every prefetch fill, uh, uh, you uh, the Pithya again looks up into the evaluation queue using the filled uh, prefetch field address. And if, if a corresponding entry is found in the evaluation queue, it simply sets a filled bit in the evaluation queue. This filled bit would be useful to determine whether the prefetch fill actually happened after the demand request for that corresponding uh, prefetch request has come or before it, it, it was uh, like it came before than the prefetch field. So if it came before than the prefetch field, then uh, then the prefetch was late, right? Because the field happened 
before uh, sorry the fill happened after the demand came from the core uh, but if the fill happened after the demand came from uh, sorry uh, the fill happened before the demand came from the core then the, the corresponding prefetch would be uh, timely as well as accurate so so now let's take a closer look at how prithia generates the prefetch uh, like prefetch decision right so for generating every prefetch decision prithia needs to look up the q restore to find the action with the maximum q value so for in this case let's say the the we take the same example uh, state uh, vector into consideration let's say this is a vector of two features the pc plus delta and the sequence of last four deltas right so pithia uses the state vector to look up the q restore to retrieve the q value for each action individually for example let's say the uh, prefetch offset plus 1 prefetch offset plus 2 plus 3 and so on and so forth right uh, after retrieving the q value for every action pithia finds out which action has the maximum q value and then it uses that action to generate the prefetch request so essentially what it means that for a fast prefetch prediction we need to have a fast retrieval of q values from the q restore because we need to retrieve the q uh, q values for all the possible prefetch actions right and so the fast retrieval inherently means that we need an efficient storage organization of the q values in the q restore itself now a very naive way of organizing the q values in the q restore can be a simple monolithic two dimensional tables right which is indexed by the state and the action values but the problem of a monolithic two dimensional organization is that the state space ex increases exponentially with the number of bits required to represent the state for example uh, this this example state information would require 67 bits to represent one state information which inherently uh, needs to to the past 67 uh, states in the state dimension and the 127 actions in the actions dimensions which is you know, uh, resulting a gigantic size monolithic two dimensional table. Right? So such a huge table not only increases the design complexity of the entire prefecture, but also increases the access latency, uh, access latency of the accessing this table. So, so to, to, to address this challenge, we, we organize the Q, uh, the Q, Q we store into K vaults, where the K is the number of, uh, features that we have, uh, activated in the system. So each fault corresponds to one program feature and stores the Q value of the feature action pairs. Now to retrieve the Q value for a state action pair for every action, uh, we, we, uh, Pithya takes three steps. The first, it queries each vault in parallel with the feature value and the action value. It retrieves the feature action Q value from each vault and then finally takes a numerical maximum operation of all the feature action key values to compute the final state action key value. Now, why is this maximum operation? Because maximum operation ensures that the uh, state action Q value is driven by the constituent feature of the state that, ha that has the highest feature action Q value. So essentially you can think of this operation as a max pooling where e uh, you, you're pulling uh, in, in a, using a max operation from each of the individual features that are uh, activated at the same time. Now, if we, if we focus on the vault organization uh, more, then every vault is further uh, organized in different planes. The, each of the plane essentially stores a partial key value of a feature action pair. Now to retrieve the feature action, uh, the Q value of a feature action pair from each action, Pithya takes three steps again. The first, it queries each plane in parallel with a hash value of the feature information and the raw value of the action information. So that's that's the lookup. Uh, from, from each plane, it retrieves a partial feature action Q value from each plane and then computes a sum of all partial feature action Q value to finally retrieve the feature action Q value of that feature and the action pair. Okay. So now the 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 again this 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 hierarchical organization of uh, constituting a vault in multiple planes actually enables us like two key benefits the first benefit is that uh, it enables a sharing of partial q value between similar feature values so basically the idea here is that if the feature values are similar or let's say the ne uh, nearby in the feature space then they would actually share uh, the partial q values in the, in the different pla uh, different planes also now this sharing significantly shortens the prefetcher training time because 
like the similar feature can actually train together and and uh, increase the uh, let's say the, learn the feature action queue value in a, to, together but it also like having the multiple plane also enables us to reduce the chances of sharing partial queue value across a widely different feature values which are let's say which are not at all similar to each other in the feature space essentially so 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 yeah so we envision this this q value store as a hierarchical organization if i if i just want to recap we envision the q v store as a hierarchical organization of uh, you know the vault and each vault is again for the comprised of planes and then we uh, in then we look up each plane in the maximum uh, let's say uh, parallelization possible and then we uh, you know reduce the value uh, from that, that we are retrieving from each plane and then we reduce the value that we retrieve from each vault to finally get the final uh, state action feature value okay uh, so so yeah so we have like we have described many more uh, let's say example uh, so, sorry many more in depth uh, analysis of of the design choice that we have made let's say the pipeline search operation for this entire qv store organization as well as how we are uh, uh, assigning the rewards for each individual prefetch actions how we are updating the qv store as well as the automated design space exploration in the paper and if you are interested then we definitely uh, like feel free to go through the paper and i'll also briefly touch into the automated design space exploration and on how or let's say uh, yeah how big is the exploration uh, the design space that we are looking at um, yeah later in the talk so do we have any questions still now yes rahul there is a question from youtube um, yeah. it yeah. says um, the basic pcr con configuration uses pc plus delta and, uh -huh. and the sequence of the last four deltas as a state how uh -huh. this state depends on the prefetch action taken for example uh, plus 16. can you please explain with this example uh okay i, I didn't get the question so how this state uh, depends on the uh, action taken uh, um, yeah basically that's the main question yes and he probably is confused and asked for a simple example uh that no so, so, no no so so in in this case this uh, this inform the feature information is solely coming from the program behavior right the, uh, what is the uh, let's say the control flow information uh, that, that the program is accessing right and the data flow information that the program is going through but the the dynamic uh, information the dynamic information of the system actually comes from the uh, the the system level feedback which we haven't we which we don't incorporate in the state information but in the reward information so so the, the framework is system sensitive not from the state side but from the reward side you get what i'm trying to say so so yeah so so the state inform uh, the, the the features that we have described in this in this case the features are purely derived from the program information but the program and the prefetcher itself is interacting with the system and generating the system level feedbacks also right let's say cash pollution or energy consumption or let's say memory bandwidth usage those are the dynamic information that we again take in, into, into consideration in the framework but not from the state side but from the reward side so the algorithm the, the learning algorithm takes this three pronged uh, approach right the state action and the reward but then the components of the system that we are incorporating in different places are coming from different uh, yeah, and some of them are uh, coming from the state information. Some of them are coming from the, through the reward level values, and the action is basically what the action we are taking. Hopefully, yeah, this yeah. yeah, I think Hopefully. it's pretty clear. But if, if it is still not clear, please write it. Another question in in YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have any more questions? Okay, if not, then um, maybe I can go through the uh, evaluation. Wait a second. Uh, maybe I can quickly jump into the automatic uh, design space exploration section. If we, uh, so, so, yeah. so, so, okay. So let me let me quickly describe. So this is the uh, like a brief, um, let's say, the components in the feature side 
that we have uh, swept from right so as i said like the every feature is composed of a control flow component and a data flow component right so the way we have uh, uh, designed the uh, so, sorry the, the pass the design space in this uh, in this work is that we basically we, we ask ourselves like how many features that you can think of right uh, so as i said like the feature is composed of the control flow and the data flow so that means it, you need to answer like how many control flow information you can think of how many data flow information you can think of so we actually can think of uh, let's say this this four control flow information and the eight uh, data flow information so now you can literally create a feature one feature from the cartesian product of this control flow and the data flow component so essentially we are looking at a feature space of 32 features which can be composed of any four uh, control flow and for any of this control flow, any of the eight uh, data flow components, right? So that means we have 32 raw features to start with, but then the state is actually a definition of a uh, vector of features, right? So that means you can literally consider any one combination of this, let's say like any feature as an individual uh, state information, or let's say you can think of, let's say any two combination of such features, right? Clear contributes the state information. Any three combination of such features contribute to state information. So as you can uh, like quickly guess that it would quickly explode uh, like a lot. So what we do in in our case is that once we have these thirty two uh, features defined within us, right? Then we just uh, uh, like sweep through the design space, the, the the feature space as any one combination of these thirty two possible features any two combinations so that means 32 c2 and any three combination of this 30 uh, 32 possible features like that is 32 c3 so we limit ourselves here so that essentially means that there is no um, uh, okay maybe i should put it like this so that essentially means that one can actually go a bit far from here and they can uh, you know learn, try to learn from let's say any four combination of such features or any five combination of such features right or maybe they can actually define the feature by itself in a different way by adding let's say different data flow component or different control flow component into the game and they can come up with a different uh, let's say feature definition uh, as well as a state definition so 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 yeah so to, to go back to what i was saying that we we explore uh, extensively from the uh, uh, yeah, from the from the combination of any one feature, any two feature, and any three feature out of those 32 possible features across all the work, uh, uh, traces that we have evaluated, right? And then find out uh, the the like it's it's a massive uh, massively parallel uh, uh, simulation run, right? And then we find out the uh, let's say the 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 the, the configurations, right? The, the the feature values as a winner that provides you the highest possible. Uh, performance improvement now one can actually uh, let's say uh, the, the the quick question that can come up to uh, to this type of optimization is that uh, okay so you have optimized this entire feature space exploration or let's say the uh, in any design space exploration that we are going to talk now based on a uh, set of traces that you have seen right so what is the guarantee that these uh, configuration would equally uh, work well for any trace that let's say you haven't seen it before, right? Will it will it trash like will it trash there or will it work equally well? So to answer this question, we have also uh, let's say uh, we we have a different set of traces that we haven't actually tuned any prefetchers on top of them. Okay, so those traces what we are calling as an unseen trace, right? And no prefetchers like including Pythia has been tuned on those traces before. So whatever configuration that we are doing, uh, or let's say whatever fine tuning that we are doing, we uh, freeze the configuration and then apply the same prefetcher configuration for all the prefetchers into those unseen traces. And we also show that the, 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 the performance benefit from those unseen traces are equally good as the performance from the seen traces. So we can uh, like say fairly confidently that uh, this type of automatic feature space uh, exploration and the uh, let's say the reward value configuration or which is a feature space uh, configuration can work equally well for the uh, unseen traces also maybe uh, let me let me quickly figure out wait uh, so not make this one 
comparison. Yeah. So so this is this is the unseen traces. So uh, as I said, like, like the unseen traces are evaluated on on top of five hundred uh, like completely different traces which have not been uh, tuned on uh, like any prefetches have been tuned on this pre uh, traces before. And yeah, we, we we see that similar type of performance improvement. And it's not exactly same as what we have what we are seeing for the tuned traces, but if not better actually in these classes of uh, traces. So, so yeah, I, I can come back to this uh, question later, or, or let's say come back to this discussion later if, if any, anyone has uh, you know, more uh, uh, questions around this one. So this is the basic Pythia configuration that we, we finally come up with. So the, these are the two features that we are uh, encapsul like, uh, encapsulating in our system design. These Rahul, are the maybe before going to the to the evaluation. So there is a follow up question on YouTube related to the previous questions uh, we ask. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, um, but uh, to apply this SARSA algorithm, we need a state to state dependency through actions, right? That's the question. State to state dependency through actions. So you mean uh, to 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 formulate the system uh, via uh, SARSA? Uh, is it required? I mean, the the way that I understood SARSA is that your system is uh, jumping from state uh, uh, from state and action pair to another state and action pair, and in the middle you have generated a reward that is R, right? And then you incorporate this reward into uh, uh, the learning to understand which action you want to uh, take if you have received the same state or similar state again. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, there is a requirement for the state to state dependency, but, but I can check with that. So is it the case that uh, if there is no state to state dependency or let's say if there is no dependency that the action would finally, uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay. So is the, is the concern that the state to state, if there is no state to state dependency, then uh, this optimization would fail or, 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 or what? Because as I said, like, um, so in this case, our, our optimization is actually happening uh, based on uh, like two, two things. So the first thing is that given this state, which action that you want to take, right? And, but in our case, the state is completely defined as the, uh, like the raw program features. So there is no, uh, let's say, dependency uh, from the action that you are uh, covering there, right? But dependency is coming from the fact that all the actions that you are taking is changing the, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the feedback, the, the feedback we, we are getting, let's say whether the memory bandwidth usage is high or, or the cache pollution would be higher or not. So, so we are not only just taking the action based on a state, but also taking the action given the system level feedback information. So that part still remains, right? That part doesn't go anywhere. As far as my, under my understanding that part remains. So then, then the question that we are trying to, the, the, the way that we are trying to formulate is that, okay, given this state and given the system level feedback information, what would be the be be best uh, uh, action that you want to take? But I can, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, so I can, probably read more about the theoretical side of this uh, problem statement generation if if there is a if there is a fundamental uh, let's say limitation do we have any follow up questions uh, regarding this not for now i think uh, no not for now okay okay yeah, so I think, I mean, maybe, maybe the confusion is coming from that if we, hello? I, um, I have a question okay. about evaluation, but uh, I can ask it now or when you finish, whatever you wish. 
Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll just quickly reiterate sure, what, sure. what I just said. Okay. So, so probably the key confusion is coming from the fact that our features is completely action independent. If the feature is action independent, then what exactly we are learning? So probably this is a concern that uh, I guess the author of the question is having probably. So, so I, I want to uh, clear this uh, clear this out is that. It's probably we are learning a relation between the feature to the action, but also given this system level feedback into account, what would be the action, right? So that system level feedback information is independent. It is dependent on what action we are taking. If if none of the components in the system is dependent on the action that we are taking, then essentially we are not learning anything. So the action that we are taking is dependent on the features as well as dependent on the system level uh, feedback. Maybe uh, that might clear up the confusion. But yeah, I mean, feel free to uh, you know leave the comment if it is not clear. Mm, yeah, so, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, maybe maybe I'll add something before uh, you continue, uh, Rahul. Because uh, yeah, this is I mean this is exactly uh, how I think of it. Also, basically we have a non-deterministic Markov decision process, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, that has some transition uh, when you go from state to state. It's potentially dependent on the actions that you take. But it's not necessarily also right uh, because it's it's non-deterministic. There are things that are not in the control of the agent in the end. Uh, what uh, the Markov decision process does is really uh, it describes uh, this transition probability function between the states and the reward function describe the environment that the agent operates in, and you learn uh, based on the actions you take and the reward values you get. Uh -huh. to navigate that environment essentially no no uh, so, okay maybe, maybe again I, I want to clear clear this up so if if we are envisioning this problem as an mdp then the bandwidth level information or resolution level information also it gets included exactly. in the uh, state in okay if if you are envisioning this as an mdp Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we are envisioning this as an MDP, then the bandwidth level feedback, let's say whether the memory bandwidth usage is high or not, or whether the en energy consumption is high or not, right? The, uh, the PC that you're trying to access, the address that you're trying to touch, or the last few sequences of PC that you have seen, all of this information is con contributing to the state information. But while we are in, uh, implementing this in the framework, we have taken part of that problem to the feature and the part of the information as the reward uh, level categorization. So in the end, we are still learning from both of this information, but then both of this information are not implemented in the same exact, uh, let's say, way. So what do I mean by this? So, so let's say you can also envision a system where the feature actually has the bandwidth as a information. So let's say PC plus Delta plus bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think we're on the same page. Basically, it's it's not just the state that defines your learning. It's really the it's really the entire uh, uh, let's say state, the transition probability distribution that you are potentially trying to learn, mm -hmm. uh, and the reward function. Right? It's 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 all of them together. Essentially. Yeah. So, so we we deliberately actually we deliberately put the system level feedback not in the feature side but in the reward side because you're okay so i have actually tried out with uh, putting it in the feature side so why would i even care to drop it from the feature side and incorporate it in the reward side is the following if we add this information in the feature side let's say the way i have implemented it's a let's say a two uh, two bit bucket bucket value of the bandwidth usage right so so essentially you have a bandwidth uh, the entire bandwidth usage in, uh, categorized into four buckets you can say, uh, say it's extremely low it's mildly low it's mildly high and it's extremely high let's say four buckets so that means you have two bits of information coming from the bandwidth side but then if you're considering let's say pc plus delta that itself consists of let's say at least 32 bit even after hashing right and then you can you can hash it even further right so then it's it's like disproportionately large 
that your state space becomes more dominated by the feature rather than the bandwidth like the system level feedback right so so then when you add let's say pc plus delta plus bandwidth as a single concatenated value and then hash it down then that band the effect that you are seeing or expected to see from the bandwidth side is completely gone by, by the hashing so that's why we actually taken these two things apart we have some some of the information represented as the feature itself and some of the information uh, we feed it back to the system from the reward side so if we envision the mdp the mdp itself contains all the information let's say the system level feedback what is the state of the cache what is the state of the uh, let's say uh, memory controller everything should be a part of the uh, state information itself now it it would be up to us how we want to implement the final uh, 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 let's say framework right that we want some part of this uh, uh, in the feature side and some part of it we are feeding back in the reward side that's what we uh, like did in this case yeah that ma- that makes sense i think and and it's a practical choice because clearly if you yeah, put everything exactly. into the feature size you may lose or you may not have enough bits to represent the information oh, right and so, uh, my, my, exp- my 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 guess would be that even if it let's say having pc plus delta plus bandwidth as a feature even if it would learn that okay there is some uh, let's say side effect for if, if you have those bandwidth bits like two bits to be 0 0 or 0 1 it would need a lot of uh, samples to even learn from that part and we cannot afford to like you know train for that long time that's why we make a conscious decision of where to put where so that in the end you you end up achieving what you want to achieve but not on the let's say the extremely uh, long trainable uh, method let's say exactly yeah yeah i think that makes sense uh, maybe uh, maybe if there are any follow up questions uh, we can we can handle them related to that yeah hopefully but yeah. it- if it's not clear by now then uh, for sure uh, like have the question uh, written down there itself and okay. i'll try to answer it again uh, yeah. with respect to that uh, have a quick question so um uh, fundamentally mm-hmm. i guess the difference between incorporating the um band with all the system level feedback to the features mm-hmm. uh, and doing it indirectly through the reward uh, I mean, indirectly into the learning process through the reward, mm-hmm. uh, is that in the second case where you do it indirectly, it affects the the values into the Q value table, right? So essentially, the values are modified based on the uh, system level feedback because the reward is different. You have low bandwidth or high bandwidth, mm-hmm. right? So you essentially, mm-hmm. incorporate this. Uh, learning process into this value in the Q value and the memory bandwidth um, so that it, the, the state action pairs learn based on these values that are changed based on the bandwidth. True. This true. Value table are changed based on the bandwidth, right? Yeah. And they did not incorporate the bandwidth in the in case you incorporate it into the, in the bandwidth. They would have a different entry, that's it. You would see history of bandwidth use. Like you would incorporate probably better the history of bandwidth, right? Probably, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can also have, yeah, exactly. Tertiary dependency also. Let's say what is the history of bandwidth and then take this action. That's true. Is that, hello? I have another question, but uh, you can finish your uh, talk and I can, it's about the evaluation, so. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll go back to the evaluation now. So, so yeah, maybe may, may we, we can have the questions uh, while during the evaluation is going on, probably. Okay. Okay. Do we have any more questions, Luis, from the audience? Okay. If not, then I'll uh, like I'll quickly go through the simulation methodology and then. Uh, then I'll jump into the evaluation, uh, like comprehensive evaluation. So, okay. So this is uh, so we, we evaluate uh, Pythia in Champsim trace driven simulator, and, and we evaluate uh, across a wide range of um, single core memory intensive workload traces and that spans across uh, spec CPU, PASIC, Lydra, and cloud suit workloads. And we also evaluate uh, 
pithia uh, in 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 uh, multi core uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous stress mixes and we compare pithia's performance against five state of the art prefetches namely spp bingo mlop spp plus dispatch and spp plus uh, perceptron filter so okay so as i said like this is the basic pithia configuration the out of the uh, out of the box configuration that we uh, have uh, explored in in this uh, like later on in the evaluation and and yeah so this is this is derived from the okay so this is derived from the automatic design space exploration it consists of two uh, features in the state pc plus delta sequence of last four lettles uh, action space contains uh, 16 prefetch offsets uh, few of them are negative most of them are positive uh, including the zero and this is the reward level value that that uh, we, we configured with it and later on, we will also show like if we if we go back to that strict configuration that we have envisioned before, how we, we, it would change the the the, the behavior of the uh, prefecture. So now let's quickly uh, evaluate the Pythias performance in systems with varying. So this is our which has become all the way up to twelve core, and as you can see, like Pythia uh, significantly outperforms. Uh, multiple prior prefetches in uh, many type of core configurations. In single core, uh, Pythia outperforms the next base performing prefetches in law by 3.4% on average, whereas in the 12 core configuration, Pythia outperforms in law by 7.7% on average. So the key takeaway from this figure is uh, twofold. The first, Pythia consistently provide good uh, performance benefit in all core configurations. And the second one is that Pythia's performance can increase in the increase in uh, core count. Now let's analyze Pythia's performance in systems with uh, varying DRAM bandwidth. And, and this is like typically uh, useful for designing uh, prefetches for different types of, uh, let's say, uh, you like targeted for different uh, markets basically. So, so this is how prior prefetches perform in different uh, DRAM bandwidth configurations. The baseline bandwidth configuration uh, is marked here in the red. And, and the, all the other configurations, the shaded configurations are roughly modeling uh, the per core uh, main memory bandwidth uh, available in, in uh, popular commercial processors. So as you can see, like uh, Pythia significantly outperforms all prior prefetches in a wide range of DRAM configuration. And most importantly, uh, in the extreme, uh, extremely uh, limited bandwidth configuration, it, it also maintains to, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's as best uh, as best as uh, having a no prefecture rather than uh, reducing the performance from the no prefecture baseline also. So in the highest DRAM bandwidth configuration, Pythia outperforms MLOB by uh, 3%, whereas in the lowest DRAM bandwidth configuration, Pythia outperforms MLOB uh, by 17% on average. We are considering MLOB to be the anchoring point for this uh, dis uh, discussion for, for results in this case because uh, MLOP is the one that that uh, provides the highest performance in the single code. But as you can see, like there are other prefetches like SPP, which also scales, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pretty nicely. And 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 uh, Pythia like significant like, so, like Pythia consistently improves performance not only in the highest bandwidth configuration but also in the lowest bandwidth configuration, and and like pushes the. the, the Ability or let's say the pushes the, uh, the range of performance uh, deliverance and across a wide range of uh, uh, bandwidth configurations pretty significantly. So the conclusion here from this uh, this figure is that Pythia also outperforms by best performing prefetches in a wide range of DRAM bandwidth configurations. So now let's let's uh, come back to the uh, performance improvement via the customization that we have discussed. And in this case, we'll revisit the strict Pythia configuration that we have introduced before uh, just to jog the memory, the re, uh, strict Pythia configuration was created by increasing the rewards for no prefetching by decreasing the rewards for the inaccurate prefetching. So in a sense, strict Pythia is more conservative as we discussed before in generating prefetch request than the basic Pythia configuration that we have uh, discussed in the beginning of the uh, uh, methodology section. So, so we evaluate the Pythia, strict Pythia configuration as well as the basic Pythia configuration on all LIGRA graph processing workloads. And we see that uh, strict Pythia even outperforms basic Pythia configuration by as much as 7.8% uh, in, in, in uh, specific uh, graph, uh, graph processing kernels and as much as uh, like 2% uh, on average across all 18 uh, 14 graph processing kernels and, and together uh, as compared to the, even the basic Pythia configuration. 
so the key takeaway from uh, the figure is that pithia can uh, like pithia can be easily uh, let's say customized in silicon without requiring any changes to the underlying hardware to provide even higher performance benefits via simple customization than the than the basic uh, pithia configuration okay so all of this uh, performance improvement comes at a modest overhead of 25.5 kb of total metadata storage per core which is primarily uh, invested in uh, designing only those simple tables that we have discussed like the walls and the uh, and the planes and etc to uh, to to faithfully analyze pithia's area over it as well as the latency requirements in a traditional commercial processor we also model a functionally fully functionally accurate pithia with its full complexity in the chisel hardware descriptive language the model is also available online in in, in our github repository so what we see here and then what we show that uh, pithia in the fully functional like for, for fully detailed version using the chisel hardware descriptive language it shows that pithia has a modest 1. Uh, a simple one percent area over it, uh, half a percent of power over it at, uh, over a desktop class four core Skylake -like processor, while simultaneously while simultaneously satisfying the uh, prediction latency of a L2 prefetcher. So so yeah so then then we have like many more uh, results uh, that are discussed in the paper. For for example, like what I have just shown, the performance comparison with unseen traces, where we show that Pythia provides equally high performance benefits as the seen traces that we just described. We also show uh, some comparison against uh, commercial multi-level prefaces that we typically find in uh, today's commercial processes, and we show that Pythia outperforms the, the best multi-level prefaces also. Uh, then we have uh, analysis of understanding what Pythia is essentially learning, and we, we argue against well, why the, those learnings are correct in term, by by analyzing the trace itself and by analyzing each individual actions and um, uh, yeah, well, asking the correctness of those actions. Uh, we have many more performance sensitivity results uh, towards different program features, different hyperparameter values, different simulation configurations. And we also have like detailed uh, single core four core performance results. All of them are, can be found in the uh, in the paper. And please also note that the the archive version of the paper we have added uh, many more uh, let's say sensitivity studies, many more uh, uh, let's say performance analysis which we couldn't uh, add in the in the, in, the, in the in the ACM version of the paper due to the space limitations. So, if you want to look for the uh, let's say the more most detailed analysis of the study, then feel free to go to the uh, archive version of the paper, and you'll get, see a lot of studies in there in the, in the, uh, the appendix section. Okay, so so yeah, so that 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 actually uh, yeah kind of ends uh, the evaluation section. Uh, Constantinus, if you want to go ahead with the question that you wanted to ask in the evaluation. Yeah. yeah. The, um... The question is about the the training and the exploration actually phase of the algorithm and how the algorithm explores. So the question is the following: When you were doing the, did you take the, into account this exploration phase in the evaluation, and is it covered up by the warm up that you're doing during the evaluation, or is it something that you really take into account? And mm -hmm. second question is that how much how how well does this exploration uh, work compared to other uh, prefetchers that use this type of heuristics on the features, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they are trying to build some confidence because the the prefetchers which are trying to build confidence is not the same as <clears throat> running exploration steps with Pythia, right? Mm -hmm. The question okay. is to uh, okay. So if I want to summarize what you just asked, is like your, your your concern is that um so the RL agent by itself has some exploration and the exploitation phase, right? And and we have uh though we haven't uh, I haven't shown it, it here that we, there is something called the uh, epsilon uh, greedy algorithm for uh, balancing the exploration and the exploitation. And the question that you are asking is that if it continuously learns, if it is continuously learning, then how much performance uh, waste is that we are expecting from uh, this prefecture based on the uh, exploration or let's say how long is this exploration anyway uh, as compared to uh, the, the the prior prefetches correct 
Yes, and I, I guess this is important in, it's, it's not probably really important in uh, long running workloads that run for minutes or hours. Mm -hmm. I it's more important in workloads with short lived functions like serverless computing uh -huh. of, of workloads that have short lived. Uh, or maybe this is also uh, also good for, let's say, uh, yeah, if you have uh, context switches, right? Uh, yes, yes, if you have also frequent context switches. Okay, okay. So, so to answer this question, so um, I would like to do the following. So, so the way that we have evaluated and, and we have reported all of these numbers, right? Every bar, every graph that we are seeing here has the same, uh, let's say, uh, methodology of doing the experiments. So the methodology goes like this. So we have um, the, the first 100 million instructions, if it is a single code experiment, the first 100 million instruction we use to warm up the code and the next 500 million instruction we execute to uh, report the performance results and all the other statistics from the, those 500 million instructions, right? So now, even with the same, uh, let's say warm up and the same warm up versus, uh, let's say simulation window, uh, Pithya eventually provides better performance improvement than the other uh, prior prefetches, right? So that essentially uh, gives us confidence in stating this, that um, Pithya, Pithya's training time or the time that it would uh, require to explore the state, uh, state action space is not uh, worse than the heuristic-based uh, algorithms okay but then the question is that what happens if we if we uh, let's say uh, reduce the uh, warm up right the, the the question that you ask right okay uh, uh, if it is a short lived function which is not probably executing in a orders of minutes or orders of hours then you might not even have let's say 100 million instructions to even warm up the face so will it still work so the map would be really small right so, so to that's a good question actually. So we have done some studies there. Uh, wait a second, let me yeah. So, so, so this is the this is the performance chart that uh, that I, I want to um, focus on here. That on the x-axis we have so so all the bars, uh, SPP, Bingo, MLOP, and Pithya are shown here. All the bars are showing the performance improvement in uh, averaged across all 150 workloads. Okay. And then on the x-axis, we uh, y-axis we have the geomain uh, speed up over the no progressing baseline, and the x-axis you have the number of uh, warm-up instructions in millions. So zero essentially doesn't mean that it's exactly zero, but in this zero case we have uh, provided very few instructions for warm-up, uh, five thousand to be exact. Okay, but then we execute five hundred million instructions to get the uh, like the statistics. Okay, so what we want to uh, rule out from in the, uh, rule out in this case is that is the longer warm up is giving you uh, giving us the illusion that uh, uh, the pithia uh, the pithia is a RL agent getting trained in the warm up phase and then it can uh, then it can uh, let's say uh, take uh, good actions here or not. But what, what we are seeing is that even with the smallest warm up of five, only, only merely like 5,000 instructions, it still has the similar performance gap as compared to the prior workloads, right? Though the overall, overall performance, like right, the overall performance is dropping a bit, correct? But then the gap between uh, the gap between the prior, uh, the performance of the prior based performing prefetches and the uh, Pythia the lead stays the same. So, so the conclusion that I want to make from this, this uh, uh, chart is that uh, whatever Pithya learns online, right, based on the exploration and exploitation that it does, is still good enough to uh, have a similar training speed as a heuristic based uh, prefetching algorithm. So does it does it answer your question? Yes, I understand. Yeah, I, it's clear. Yeah. So so what I want to when like the, the the key takeaway here is that even if you have like a smaller uh, warm up, right? So essentially, you are not giving any chance to uh, the agent to even you know initialize uh, it weight matrix in such a way that at least it can go and do better in the next five hundred million simulation instruction. 
still it's good enough to you know simply just go and learn it online right based on whatever epsilon infinity algorithm uh, we have implemented inside and it would still come up uh, come out to be time uh, like better uh, than the previous works yeah but i understand this and it, for these type of workloads i agree but it would be i think different if the workload was short lived because then the the effect yeah. and the overhead of this exploration would be more uh you would observe it in the performance probably of the prefetcher right mm -hmm. so uh, well, prefetchers probably like, not just your prefetcher in all the prefetchers uh -huh. so when you say short lived means you, you uh, like you don't even want to have like say 500 million instruction to be executed you let's say just 10 million instructions without let's say any warm up is that is that something what we're saying uh yes okay yeah, okay um yeah so that uh, yeah we we haven't actually done that that study but i can i can definitely do that study and uh, update the uh, archive version uh, based on our findings for sure yeah so at least in this study what we have done is to shrink down the warm up phase but as you suggested right that we haven't shrunken down the uh, the simulation phase also we can do that and and, and check whether, whether it still holds the lead or not. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is possible, but uh, somehow removing the overhead of the, no, somehow calculating the overhead from the exploration phase or uh, like it would be <laughs> interesting. But okay. Uh, in yeah, so, so one way to at least empirically check how how this exploration might affect so let me come to this uh, sensitivity study so in this case uh, on, uh, only look into the left uh, left side of the chart for now uh, right uh, required for us for now so the last part what we what we are doing is that the epsilon value right the epsilon means that uh, so if the epsilon value is uh, okay, uh, point 0.1 so point 0.1 epsilon means it says that okay um, so every one in 10 uh, uh, instances uh, pithia would take some random action okay and every nine instances it would take uh, 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 let's say uh, like it would explore for uh, every one in a 10 instances and it would exploit whatever it has learned for nine in a 10 instances okay so as a uh, the the question that you tried to ask is that is there a way to like kind of segregate this uh overhead of learning and how much uh let's say yeah how, how much uh effort or let's say how much um uh yeah performance loss we can expect if we you know just always learn or let's always do not learn and such uh, in that sense so yeah probably this is this is what the chart uh, would look like and what what the the takeaway from the chart is that the following that if you if you so after the point the exp, even if you do a very aggressively less exploration you have so many instructions that you are simulating right still those many explorations are good enough to uh, at least give you uh, a, a, an optimal value right but then if you have a aggressively higher amount of exploration right so essentially what you are doing is that your your agent is simply exploding and exploding without exploiting what you have uh, what the agent is learning right then it significantly drops actually so in this case the extreme one is the uh, epsilon value is one so that means it would just simply always explode so it's, it's as good as taking a random prefetch actions for every time and as you can see that random prefetch ran, doing a random prefetch based on that that uh, the the the, the uh, set of actions that we have is you know like like significantly lesser than what it can achieve uh, if you fine tune uh, the exploration rate so so yeah so uh, uh, like the takeaway uh, in, in takeaway I, I would say that uh, we need to uh, like the exploration does indeed have an impact on the final performance improvement but yeah, unless you are not making it extremely exploration heavy, the exploration should still like uh, a decent enough exploration that should also provide you good uh, performance benefit. Okay, that's, it. Yeah, that's, 
that's a kind of answer your question i mean probably it's not easy answering your question it's just an empirical study right uh, but it yeah but you cannot easily you know i think yeah yeah i understand and what i asked is about different types of workloads also right so yeah actually okay yeah so th- th- this one is average across everything so it's not just a workload specific right so so yeah i mean maybe that might be also the case that some workloads it might be too much sensitive for training uh, or let's see if you have a shorter simulation window also that might fail or let's say you underperform the MTGS box. True, true. But it, as I said, I think it will affect the rest of the prefetures also, not just Pythia. Yeah, that, that might also be the case that uh, the rest of the prefecture is also learning something, right? And so maybe that confidence, right? So yeah, I mean, the, the, the best way to answer this would be to uh, probably uh, do this evaluation and then check by ourselves, right? And then, yeah, we, will, we, we can put it up, put it up in the uh, revised version of the archive. Thanks, Konstantinos. Do you have any more questions from the audience, Luis? So, Rahul, I have a, a question also related to like the, the graph you're showing here. So if I read correctly, like if epsilon becomes very like uh, rare, no, the, the 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 time that you are actually uh, taking a random decision, it doesn't mm-hmm. affect performance. Meaning that there is there is a point where you converge and then you just stay there for forever, almost, no? Uh, kind of. At least the average uh, data, the, the average performance improvement uh, across all the single code traces. This is single code, by the way. It points to that direction itself. Mm-hmm. It probably says that okay, you're, you're, once you have explored, uh, yeah, your explosion rate should be, uh, yeah, at something at max. Mm-hmm. But I think it doesn't show like the, the correct intuition here. I, sh- I think you should penalize also very rare explorations because it means that you cannot adapt anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. I mean, so, so that, that's what I, I, I also believe in this case that there might be actually workloads, right, which, which might actually get saturated pretty quickly by, by even, uh, you know, like this amount of exploration, right? But then there might be some other workloads, which would probably require more exploration uh, to, to, to go to that global optima, right? So, so, so yeah, I mean, maybe this chart might not say the entire picture, but yeah uh, because like uh, this like uh, so is there a way of also of like uh, tuning at runtime epsilon no depending on some feedback you get of like okay now i am actually off no like with my policy i need to converge to a new one quickly mm-hmm. yeah that that's a good question david uh, so so the, actually there are ways okay there are ways to uh you know start with a very high uh, exploration rate and then uh, telescopically reduce that exploration rate once you have reached, uh, let's say, a, a consensus, right? Or like for to to, uh, to to go back to the uh, uh, let's say to to, to go back to the uh, domain of uh, deep learning, right? So we have the learning rate, and then the learning rate, uh, let's say, starts with a very uh, small value, and then they increase it, and then they keep on checking in some parameters whether whether let's say from this iteration to the next iteration, whether the improvement is beyond the limit or not. If it is still within the sum limits, that means probably we have converged, right? And then we can probably, you know, try out a new uh, learning rate. So yeah, I I think that there is a way to do this. It's called probably adaptive exploration or something like that. So so the E starts with something uh, big and then you try to reduce it. We can do that for sure. We can do that. But for now, I guess, uh, like for now, I have just simply fixed it in a like a static value. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I understand. So, that, but then, like this, like have, have you experimented? Like, uh, if you do that for one particular application and you let it like freeze, and then you take this state and you just mm-hmm. run it on a new uh, like program. So, is it really different the policy that you get there from the other one? You so you mean uh, oh, okay okay so you you mean uh, transferring the learning from one workload to the other workload yes exactly okay so 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 this is a good question again uh, so right now all the training that uh, or let's say all the way that we have modeled in this case right it's like all the traces are getting uh, like starting from scratch right the agent is completely initializing from scratch 
you have a warm up the agent learns something in the warm up and then you have a simulation correct but then it's very much possible that we don't have to initialize every time from the scratch the agent we can literally have let's say once the one trace is done you dump the uh, let's say table uh, like a qv store and then for the next trace you can initialize the qv store uh, yeah right now i cannot uh, let's say intuitively say on top of my head how it would behave but for uh, me like a, like a, the it's not so interesting for the initialization but more like uh, if you can exploit that for reducing the implementation cost of pcr you see reducing the table sizes because you find like a lot of commonalities maybe they don't need to be variable but they can become constant for like this instantiation of a prefetch you see you like the, the table might not be this big anymore you, you okay, can like can, can we do some sort of like a knowledge distillation you see page I understood okay okay yeah, yeah that, that that might be a valid reason actually yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't actually okay so yeah i haven't checked this part that how uh, once let's say after the entire uh, training uh, not not training like the entire simulation has been done what is the state of the q value tables for each workloads and how much they are similar to one trace to the other but maybe they don't need to be similar but sometimes they can be equivalent you know even you may not see them as equal but they may have very similar behavior yeah probably so it is difficult like maybe to visualize no when they are like like i don't know how to plot that no you you, you cannot compare like value by value i guess no no you can i mean yeah so you cannot compare by value by value uh well, you, you can at least that that's that's the easiest. I don't know what I mean, like, maybe it doesn't tell you the whole truth, right? Like yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The, the ultimate test is like, okay, if I just like transplant not this to the new like the program, is it gonna be still like behaving like uh, optimally or like as good as before? Yeah, that that that's a good experiment actually. I, I can yeah, yeah, we can we can try this out. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. I mean, I mean, uh, this is a yeah. I mean, the, this is a uh, 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 new, uh, let's say, uh, direction that that I haven't actually thought before. But but yeah, I mean, uh, to be, as I say, like like uh, I haven't actually checked uh, what is the like similarity, right, or commonality of of the knowledge that that uh, it, it, it's learning from trace to trace, and and how they are similar across traces. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, 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 we can do that. I mean, we can do that to uh, yeah, I mean, potentially reduce the training time even more, let's say, right? Or, or I mean, so any, okay, so I have to be clear about uh, this uh, in, in this context. So training time means it's not the training time uh, in a, the notion of, uh, from the notion of the supervised learning, right? So in this case, the training time is essentially like you're always training, right? But then any uh, decision that you are making for exp uh, exploration is probably a, a potential loss of opportunity yeah so so if we if we can converge to the optimal uh, quicker then that would be even uh, more performance uh, uh, beneficial you know beneficial to more uh, performance yeah. because i think like like a pcr like it is a, like a like a, a very nice contribution shows that this kind of uh, like uh, RL based agents, they are very useful, no? Like mm -hmm. uh, functionally. So the question it is like, uh, can we keep the like the utility while making it even cheaper, no? Because one of the concerns that someone might have is like, okay, if you show that it is like, it doesn't require a lot of memory, but it is compared to other refreshing solutions still more, right? That's true. Yeah. This, this could like be a, still a showstopper. So like uh, pushing the limits there, I think could be interesting. And then uh, the other like, uh, open front, I think it is also very interesting. It's like uh, based on like the discussions that you were having before, like uh, reinforcement learning always starts from the assumption that you have defined a well uh, reward function. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the contributions that you have also there is the fact that you could form formalize this reward function for the prefetching problem itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and you did it in a flexible way because you have a parametric function that then you show that you can actually, as a human, no? Like, exactly. uh, but still, I think there is like a need, no, for the formal learning to be, be better understood. Is like how can we formalize not what you, now you did as a human? Can we mm -hmm. do it in a more formal way? 
because ultimately we care about like a higher level metrics. We don't need to decide what are like the, the, the different coefficients. If you see, you are deciding on coefficients as a human. Yes. Okay. Okay. I understood. So you are essentially saying that, okay, I mean, for, for example, if I draw the analogy from re, like uh, prefetching to the game of Go, right? The, the way the AlphaGo learns is that whether in the end, whether I have lost against the opponent or been won against the opponent. Yeah. I yeah, have yeah, yeah, whether this, this is the high level game. metric, right? That you care about. And in your case, it's like high performance. You only care about performance in this kind yeah, of. Actually, I, I, actually, then uh, that's a valid concern. So initially, when when I d I also did this exploration, right, and, and I, I was de developing uh, this thing. So uh, I, I started uh, having another uh, like a set of reward based on just the IPC, right? That okay, what is a raw IPC, and how, what if if I just simply you know feedback the raw IPC because in the end that that's what it matters to us, right? Performance. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> so um so 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 yeah i mean um we can try that out we can try that no, no, out. No, but I, i'm not saying that because like you show actually like by doing that like naively the problem is like then the agent is not able to learn efficiently so okay so you, you have like to interface properly with the agent through like a, like functions like a reward functions that enable the learning efficiently which they don't mean that they are the same rewards as like what is your ultimate objective as a designer which is maybe high performance. So how to bridge? Yeah, that? so that, that's that's the question in a, in a kind of in a formal way, no? Like uh, this, yeah. So uh, as I said, like uh, David, like uh, uh, as I answer, so I, I'd like to answer this with the, the same way that I have answered this question before. That I I really believe that it's possible. It's possible to have a very a uh, high level reward, right? Which uh, high level reward given to the agent, and we expect the agent to automatically learn. Uh, the low level constructs like okay maybe to achieve this high level reward what we need to do is probably to prefer accurate prefetches uh, and and if, uh, not prefer inaccurate prefetches if the memory bandwidth usage is high and so on so forth. That, 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 it can actually infer and i i i i i hope no no not i hope like uh, how should i say like i think that it can infer but then the question might be that how long it should uh okay my, my my guess would be that if even if it can infer then it it needs to see a lot of uh let's say samples to infer that in yeah but i think like so like if you uh, my take there is like it, there are two different problems we cannot solve them in the same shot so like the reinforcement like uh, learning agent it is not the one that has to decide on the uh, reward function you see we have to decouple it it is very similar in my head to like a uh, uh, you know, like, for instance, like this kind of transformer learning uh, where they have like this auto embedding as a first phase. So they design mm -hmm. embeddings that then they are used in the reinforcement learning agent later on. So I think like this auto embedding, it's what you did manually now, like as like uh, designing yeah. what is the reward embedding. function. Yeah, exactly. Em embedding itself represents the game, uh, like board game or, or the state. Or like, the the uh, you remember this paper from Google where they were like uh, doing auto placement. Chip placement, yes, okay. yes. So, like that, they had also the same problem. They didn't know, like, okay, is it a good placement or not? So they created a separate process, no, to learn what are good placements and what are good. Like in their in their case, it was cost functions, but we could do the same for reward functions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. I, like as I said, like like I guess the, the, the like this type of in, like learning is possible. The only thing that we have to answer in the end is like, what is the cost of that learning? If the cost is justified, uh, cost in the sense, let's say, uh, like prefetching being a very dynamic problem, right? It, it might actually happen that uh, if, we, if we provide a very high level construct uh, as a notion of reward to the system, it, it took so many uh, opportunities. It, it, it actually had to explore so many options to even learn that correlation. That you, in the end, you are actually uh, losing the performance because every opportunity that you are missing for, uh, let's say, exploration is potentially a, a opportunity that you have missed for exploitation, right? So, so yeah, I mean, but I there, said, are, there I see like a partition. So, like uh, this kind of uh, auto embedding, it is a, a design time, like a process that you do, and then once you have it at runtime, you don't, you you already know, you know, you instantiate it at runtime.
Okay. And then you don't have to explore it anymore. But like for a domain of prefetching, you have to run it once. And then you can reuse it for all prefetching algorithms, or like a reinforcement learning algorithms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's a definitely a direction. It's definitely a direction to yeah. I, I also believe like this is just an initial phase of the framework. I mean, it's it's definitely there are multiple things that we can do on top of this one to make it even better. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a very nice contribution. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, do we have any questions? Any more questions? Okay. If not, then I'll, I'll quickly. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll ask some questions since you're moving on to something else. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Okay. You. Uh, okay. Uh, so, can you go to this basic PTA configuration uh, that you showed? I think it was in the backup slides. Or maybe it's also here. Yeah, yeah. here. You can go to the tab. Yeah, I think, the, I think the table is actually more yeah, yeah, yeah. informative, let's say. Yeah, let's see. This is, yeah, this is one. Yeah. OK. And you, you arrived at this completely automatically, right, using mm -hmm. the design space exploration. Yeah. yeah. So OK, I think this is uh, interesting, especially in the prefetch action list, uh, yeah. because these are yeah. some offsets that automatic design space exploration selected. Yes. Uh, so I think there are two issues here, two or two questions here. First of all, mm -hmm. why are these offsets, let's say, selected? Are they more popular than other offsets? Mm -hmm. And the second is, let's assume that you get a workload where none of these offsets are, in the, are uh, matching the access pattern. What mm -hmm. happens in that case? Is there still a, a way to, uh, let's say, do good prefetching in that workload where the prefetch action list doesn't match the offsets you see in the workload. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So, so both of these questions are actually a good one. Okay, so let, let me first answer the first one. That the what um, so so what happens if we no wait a sec. So the first question is like how how we end up selecting these offsets the the automatic exploration right. So so the way that we do the action list selection is the following. So we started with all the actions that are possible, right? 127 actions, as I mentioned, minus 63 to plus 63, and just get the performance out of it, right? So, and then, uh, so having a long action list might actually have a, let's say, unwanted side effects also. What is uh, what is the side effect? Is that, uh, um, so having a long action list actually has a upside is that, okay, whatever is possible, uh, uh, any possible offset is within this list. So there is no chance that, if the prefetcher wants to prefetch with some offset and then it couldn't find it in the action list, so so it's that, that's the upside. But the downside is that if you uh, if you have a longer action list, then a longer action list essentially means you have to explore a long time also because at least all the actions that you have to take at some time, it's, it's a, uh, like a uh, action taking uh, expression at some time. So 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 that also in uh, so. The, the the negative side actually can uh, truncate not not truncate, reduce the performance improvement in, in in this case correct so the way that we we uh, came uh, came up with this action list is the follows so we we get the performance number out of uh, all the single code traces for uh, this this entire action list for 127 action list right and then we do a simple uh, like, a, uh, like a linear drop right that okay if i just drop action I just drop that for you see that okay if dropping a, a, a dropping a action first of all it might actually hurt the performance it might not hurt the performance or it can even increase the performance why would my might hurt performance let's say one, one trace was there, which was heavily using that option, uh, the, the, the action, right? And then that action you have dropped, so it, it would uh, lose performance. The performance stayed the same because, okay, probably it was not even using that, that, that action anyway. And the action might increase. Why? Because, okay, dropping that action actually reduced the, uh, you know, exploration, um, uh, let's say, number of times that you have to explore. And that's, that's the reason why the performance might increase. So, performance improvement by dropping and one single action is really like very small like the improvement uh, gap is very small so more often than not what i uh, like what i uh, saw is that if you just simply drop those actions there is no uh, like real performance impact 
on the final, uh, let's say, uh, geomin speed up across all the traces. So essentially, in the end, we retain only those actions that do not have any performance drops. Uh, if I remember correctly, then uh, we have set some threshold also, like a one percent, two percent of drop. If it is beyond that, like we are not seeing any drop uh, within that limit, just simply truncate all those actions. So the idea is that even if you drop those actions, uh, your, your final performance improvement might not be as worse as uh, what you started with. So, so, so that that's the way of uh, selecting the action list. Okay. Now the question that you mentioned that okay, what what happens that if you are you are running a trace and then none of these actions are actually good, so then depending on the uh, like the feedback that the system level feedback uh, that, that that we have set right, and depending on the let, let's say the memory bandwidth usage, the uh, Pythia needs to decide whether you know inaccurate prefetching is still an option or uh, no prefetching is a better option. If the memory bandwidth usage for that workload stays consistently high, right, then it would definitely understand that okay, no prefetching is probably a better option. Then it would just simply stop prefetching. But it, it won't have idea uh, 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 this idea that okay, that offset was actually not present in my action list. That's why I cannot prefetch. If that option uh, was there in the action list, then I could have prefetched that. But unfortunately, it would just simply stop prefetching. But if the memory bandwidth usage is low, then no prefetching, uh, sorry, the inaccurate prefetching might still be an option for Pythia, right? Then it would just simply, uh, you know, like prefetch some, uh, yeah, prefetch with some actions, uh, which might end up uh, becoming inaccurate, but it would just simply, you know, inject those memory requests anyway. So yeah, so that, that would be the expected behavior. If, if the none of the prefetch offset like belongs to this action list at all yeah i see uh yeah is there a way to get over that i guess right because you're very, very much depend on the action list then yeah so so, so the easiest way to get uh, get over it to have like all the option uh, actions uh like prepared for us right but i strongly believe that even uh, the offsets on the very high end, right? So, so let's say if you have uh, um, uh, actions from, uh, sorry, with the offsets from zero to plus 63, there would be uh, like a desert zone beyond a limit that those offsets are not at all required. So at the very best we can do is that, okay, okay we can come up with a, a like minimalistic offset set of, let's say minus 16 to plus 16, or let's say minus 20 to plus 20. That still that should still be better. You you well, get what I'm saying. So instead of uh, selectively picking like this, we can still confine it based on a range. Well, I think and, the issue yeah. is not the issue is not selective picking, right? The issue is statically picking. Let's say because this is not dynamically optimized. I think selective picking is okay, but statically selecting really limits the capability of the prefetcher to adapt to dynamic workloads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if we yeah, the, actually that's true. I mean, if we want to address that issue, then yeah, either we have to come up with a, a mechanism to replace one action and try uh, yeah, randomly sampling actions from a list of master list, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we have to go through uh, the all the list uh, all the time. Basically, yeah, maybe like, yeah, maybe there's a way of learning the actions and pruning them online, right? Dynamically. And that could mm -hmm. be a that could be a next step potentially, right? Actually, that's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we, we can. Yeah, we 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 can think of a, a way to sample few actions at a time and then come up with the confidence and then some next few actions at a time and then come yeah. up with the actions that are having confidence. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, because if yeah, I think it's uh, it's good to think about it uh, in the future. I think I think there should be a way to do that actually. Because mm -hmm. if you look at existing prefetchers, they don't require predetermined action lists. They 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 find the True. strides right. You you can also yeah. uh, imagine so, okay. a way of finding the strides potentially. 
I mean, uh-huh. it's a strike is a general term, of course, right? It's really the uh, offset in this case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to just draw the analogy of, uh, let's say, based offset prefecture, right? Mm-hmm. The based offset prefecture also has something, uh, a set of offset that you can only select it from. So in this case, uh, we can think of uh, Pythia actually as a best offset prefecture with a, a better intelligence to select the best offset rather than just a table-based approach. Yeah, yeah, so, but I think so, there's yeah, still I mean, room for improvement uh, because dynamic adaptation becomes limited, right? So, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, I think there's another interesting thing. I think you you answered my uh, first question partly, but there's I was also looking for insight as to why these offsets, uh, the prefetch right. action list is as is, is it because the compiler is laying out the data structures in some way such that you're also always traversing toward higher addresses? Because if you see, if you look at this, the minus values are, negative values are in the minority, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think this is, this is also going on the same line of uh, what, uh, BOP also found, right? That uh, negative uh, strides are, uh, less frequently occurring than the positive strides and the variations of negative stride is also less in, in, than the positive stride. Uh, what is the origin of this uh, behavior? Yeah, I cannot confidently say, but I have also seen the similar uh, like behavior essentially like from, from the traces, like the negative offsets are less uh, frequently occurring than the positive ones. Yeah, I mean, if you if if you, if you lay out the data structure such that increasing indices are at increasing memory addresses, yeah, I'm maybe- traversing from the bo- uh, bottom to top, or or zero indices to higher level indices, this makes sense, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so maybe it also embeds from the way how we as a human uh, uh, code writers write our code, right? It's, it's a very high chance that we would traverse an array if, if it is there an array. We would traverse it from low to high rather than high to low, right? Maybe that's what we uh, are uh, yeah, injecting this bias, but yeah. But this certainly might not be the case if, if we have, uh, let's say, linked list type of uh, data structures, right? That might be like jumping here and there. All depends on, I think, the allocation, uh, memory allocator and the allocation patterns, uh, all of that, I think, yeah. Allocator. Yeah, I think I have another question related to evaluation. Uh, you didn't mention the hardware cost as much, or maybe I missed it. What does uh, the hardware oh. cost look like uh, and how does it compare to, yeah, I think that. Okay. This is this is a flat uh, comparison in terms of the metadata storage. So we haven't actually implemented all other prefetches in the uh, Chisel model, right? So that's why we don't uh, know how much these prefetches would also uh, incur in terms of the area or the uh, latency overhead or the power overhead in, in, in actual silicon, right? But just to get a fair uh, comparison from uh, uh, let's say apples to apples comparison so this is how pithia lines up the metadata storage at least lines up with the other ones so as you can see like uh, ppf uh, and we, we need to also take this into consideration that ppf by itself uh, is not a prefecture so ppf is just a perceptron filter so we need to add it on top of someone else so the way ppf is demonstrated is added with on top of spp Right. So similarly, dispatch is also, uh, uh, let's say, proposed as an adjunct prefecture. And then we also uh, evaluated dispatch on top of SPP. Uh, bingo is a, like a SPP, bingo and MLOP is a standalone prefecture by itself. So, so yeah, I, I think <clears throat> the, the least end we, we are seeing uh, is probably somewhere around SPP, which is 6.2 KB, right? And, and the highest end that we are uh, we are saying is probably uh, let's say SPP plus PPF, which is like almost six for six to thirty nine. That's that's like forty five KB around, or, or let's say forty six KB. This is also the, the one. So yeah, so bingo or SP plus PPF is forty five KB around. Let's say, and then Pythia uh, lines up at least in in this co- configuration that we have uh, evaluated with. In this configuration, it is uh, consuming twenty five point five KB around. So, so, so yeah, so that, that's how the, 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 they, they tally against each other. Each other. Uh, does it answer your question? Anu? Yeah, 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 it does, I think. 
Okay. And you you uh, you also have the uh, yeah. hardware so, description so, level language uh, model, right? Uh, online. That's only for Pythia. That that's only okay. for Pythia we have. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Fine. So the the HDL modeling that we have is is, is only uh, only for Pythia. So just to check, like uh, uh, like out of all of this, uh, let's a complexity, but like it can still. Uh, uh, provide the prediction latency requirements or the power over it and all of it, right? So, yeah, it's a proof of concept, essentially. Yeah. Uh, Rahul, is there a way of gracefully reducing the complexity of PCA while reducing maybe the gap that you have now, the improvement gap that you have with respect to the state of the art refreshers before PCA? I mean, it, it, it's possible, right? It's possible to, to reduce it gracefully in this sense that, okay, uh, so as a, okay, let me go back to this uh, comparison. Okay, so as I said, like here it, it says two features, two vaults, and three planes, right? So two feature inherently says there are two vaults, right? So we cannot do anything here. But then each vault is comprised of sixteen planes. We can uh, say that okay, uh, sorry, each vault is comprised of three planes. We can basically say that okay, instead of having three planes, why don't we try out with two planes also, right? That would reduce it uh, gracefully by a, a bit, right? It would also, uh, let's say, uh, reduce the uh, performance. It might reduce the performance improvement, uh, the GOM improvement across all trays. But then, if if that uh, justifies the reduction of the metadata, then yeah, we can we can do that. Right? Is that like a, like if you have SPP, you know, as like a, to have an ISO reference with uh, respect to the like a six kilobyte uh, the PCA? Is it like uh, the performance better or worse than SPP? Is it? I see, I see. Okay, so we, okay, I I haven't actually uh, done the ISO size comparison, like how uh, that would be comparing with each other. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm not sure like how easy it can be, but it, it, it's an interesting point, no, to, to know. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there, there is another dimension which is not shown here is that each plane is also consisting of, let's say, one state, uh, the, the feature dimension, right? The feature dimension is 128 in our case. And and uh, if we also reduce that dimension, that might uh, like that would also make this uh, number going down gracefully. But yeah, I, I understood your point that if if we want to compare against an ISO size SPP, how it would behave? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can configure it. Uh, I don't have the re re numbers to be reported right now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. Okay, so if we don't have uh, any further questions, I'll just simply quickly go through a brief uh, yeah, demo of the, uh, the, 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 the GitHub repository. Uh, so yeah, so uh, as I said before that PCI is open source and fully artifact evaluated. Uh, so you can find the artifact uh, as well, or the entire Champsim source code as well as the cheese and modeling code and all the traces that we have used in our evaluation from the GitHub repository. So I'll just simply quickly go through the repository structure to, you know, if, if someone wants to uh, go through it in the future. So prefetcher is the directory that, that contains all the source code of the prefetchers, includes, includes and, uh, and source directories are the uh, file headers and the implementation respectively. And then you can find all the configurations in the, uh, the dot .ini file configurations in the config directory. Okay, so the, the source.scooby.cc is the high level file. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's a long story. Dot Scooby used to be the uh, development name of Pythia at that time. So that's why uh, it, it says Scooby. So if you find uh, Scooby mentioned anywhere in the paper, uh, sorry, in, uh, in the repository, it inherently uh, points to Pythia itself. So, so yeah, so uh, scooby.cc is a, a high level file, which, which uh, interfaces the prefecture with the rest of the simulator, right? I mean, it has uh, uh, like uh, functions like invoke prefecture like this. So which invokes the prefecture, uh, prefecture generates the prefecture address on, on your behalf, right? Given this, given the signature, correct? And it generates as like a vector of prefecture address here. Uh, and then we have, uh, let's say, uh, if you go down a bit one, one level, so we have uh, two types of uh, reinforcement learning agents uh, provided in the, in, the, in the GitHub repository. So the one uh, RL engine is called the learning engine basic.cc, another one is the learning engine feature-wise.cc. So basic.cc essentially 
is the monolithic two dimensional table right so if one wants to evaluate the monolithic table feel free to uh, you know evaluate with this also but the all the numbers that we have reported is using this uh, rl engine which is called the engine feature wise so you can just simply you know uh, like move forward back and forth from these two uh, just by using this this uh, as, a, as a as a command line or you can yeah you use this as a command line as well as you can provide this in, uh, information in the config.ini file also okay and and then yeah so and this is how the features are defined here right you, you can find the feature definition in this file include uh, include the feature knowledge dot h as you can see we have the, this many features so there are other features also which i have cleaned up for for uh releasing the uh like uh, releasing the, the repository for the uh, artifact evaluation but as you can see here you you, you are seeing like 20 features uh, in this list correct and then uh, all of these features so what you have to do is basically for each feature you need to define the uh, the, the 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 knowledge uh, uh, sorry how you compute that feature based on the raw attributes that you are finding from the uh, uh, the memory request essentially so so for example if i if i take an example uh, so let's say uh, process delta so delta as a raw attribute that we are providing and then how how would we process uh, the the delta feature for us we 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 do this this calculation right whether if if it is a negative value then then we do this if it is a positive value then we make uh, something uh, different and then we do uh, the tiling offset that we have mentioned in the paper itself and then we hash it down to finally get the uh, the feature uh, index essentially so so yeah so so the feature knowledge helper uh, uh, kind of uh, let's say acts as a helper file for the feature knowledge so you just need to define your own feature here you need to define the process function here and you'll be good to go and the way that that you can uh, just provide the uh, which features that you want to use in the runtime it just simply you, you need to provide a list of feature id so you just get the id from here right the, the enum id uh, provide a comma separated list of features which for features that you want to activate and then based on those number of features you also need to uh, enable uh, all the all the configuration so again uh, the tilings is uh, analogous to uh, the vaults sorry the, the tilings is analogous to plane and the tiles is analogous to each uh, uh, yeah, partial values in the in, in the vault so i mean hopefully if, if you go through the code it, it would be evident to you right so so yeah so the, if if you're providing the list of features you just need to update uh, or provide this uh, other comma separated values also in the same uh, way, right? If it, the length is two, then all of these also have to be linked to. Uh, I mean, don't worry if if, if something uh, you're providing something as a uh, let's say invalid configuration, then it would it would show exactly what it is getting invalidated, right? Uh, what what you need to check again. So, so yeah, as I said, like in this case, I provided two features, which really means two vaults. Then for each of the vaults, we have like three planes in each vault, and each plane has 128 hash feature entries. And which type of function, a hash function that you're using for this hash generation is the hash ID two. So there are lots of hash functions that we have in the in the repository. You can play around with different hash functions also uh, by by providing different. Uh, uh, yeah, by, by providing different values here. And having this enumerated list also says that you, there is no reason that you have to, uh, sorry, uh, the, you can also asymmetrically design these walls, right? One vault might be smaller, one vault might be bigger. You can play around with any type of, uh, 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 let's say, configuration possible. Okay, so, so yeah, so if you want to define your own feature, you can easily define your own feature in three steps. The first step, you have to define a new feature uh, enumerated identified in the feature knowledge dot h, and then you have to define its corresponding processing function in the feature knowledge helper dot h. And then once these two are in place, then you just simply need to provide that enum id in the in the in the configuration file like this, and you'll be good to go. The entire entire uh, let's say framework is written in that way that it would just simply quickly pick up from there. So, so, so yeah, and, and if you want to reproduce the reported results, uh, please follow the appendix, uh, the, uh, the instructions that we have given in the appendix one. So essentially, the, we need to build the champs and download the traces and then launch the experiments and that should work pretty well. 
And this is the configuration file that we have. I mean, essentially we have distilled the configuration file in, in the table itself. We have shown it multiple times, but yeah. So this is the configuration file. Feel free to go through all the all the knobs in the file, and every knob is either active or probably I mean it has been uh, deprecated uh, throughout the development, right? And and some of them would be you know like, like just, just like this that access debug is false, zero unit is false, and some of them would, would be active, deactivated based on the value that you provide. So so yeah, just feel free to play around and and change the. Uh, configuration file as you want and hopefully uh, you might uh, see you can actually make it even better performing than what we have reported here yeah. okay so so yeah so that that would bring to my conclusion uh, maybe do we have any questions before going here or i, I can just simply conclude here. Okay, if we make question, I'll just simply conclude by reiterating that uh, in this work, we have identified three key shortcomings of the features. Uh, first, they predict mainly one single program feature. Second, they lack inherent system awareness, like every magnitude usage. And third, they lack in silicon customizability. So, uh, to alleviate these three challenges, uh, the goal of our work was to uh, design a unified prefetching framework that learns from multiple program features and inherent system level feedback information and can also be customized in silicon to use different program features uh, and the prefetching objectives on the fly. Toward this, we introduced Pythia that formulates prefetching as a reinforcement learning problem. And by extensively analyzing the performance res results, we show that Pythia outperforms multiple pair uh, based performing prefetches over a wide range of workloads and system configuration. So, so yeah, that concludes my talk. And thank you for listening. If you have any more questions, uh, feel free to ask it. Thank you. Do we have any more questions, Luis, from, from YouTube site, maybe? There are no more questions from YouTube. Okay. Thanks, Luis. Do we have any more questions from uh, our in-house audience? Okay. If we don't have any more questions, then I will uh, yeah, stop my presentation here and I will pass the ball to Auto maybe. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I can hear you, but I don't know if uh, whoever is supposed to be in charge uh, had to maybe leave for a second. So, yeah, I guess if Onur is not concluding, maybe I can do it. So, thank you, Rahul, for the very nice presentation. Thanks, uh, it was a really nice paper. I hope everybody enjoyed the, your presentation and the very nice discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and have a happy holiday. Merry happy Christmas. holidays. Merry Christmas in advance. Goodbye. Bye bye.